Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast full discography breakdown. We haven't done one of these in a while. I think the last one of these we did was when me and Jake did Sigur Rose, which is about six or seven months ago. Uh, these are more infrequent now, but really the reason for that is just that they take a lot of work and time. And what we do in this series is we take a particular artist or a particular band that we love and we talk through the entire discography, you know, principally focusing on albums as well. But when they have major EPs and minor releases, we talk about those too and try to give a full picture of who the band are, their entire lifetime up until the current moment and the get into detail with each album, what each album's about, what each album means to us, why we like each album so much, give you a full picture of the band. Now, even if you're not that well-versed in this particular band that we're talking about today, which is Ocean Size, this video is still for you because we're going to try and give a case for why we love them, why you should check them out, and why they are one of the most notable, one of the most important, one of the, our most beloved uh, progressive bands of the 21st century so far. So, Ocean Size are... A English rock band originally formed from Manchester, although none of the original members of the band are actually from Manchester, which is kind of funny. Uh, the members of the band and in the initial lineup are Mike Venert on vocals and guitar, Steve DeRose also on guitar and backing vocals, Gambler, which is the pseudonym of one Richard Ingram, who's the third guitarist in the band and also plays keyboard, plus the original bassist John Ellis and the drummer Mark Heron. So we have a five-piece rock band, and as we're going to get into with each of the albums we discussed today, they're a band that make the most of having five people in a room contributing to these very densely arranged rock songs. One interesting detail of the band's inception is that they actually formed after attending a Mogwai concert while they were at university, which is an interesting detail because I didn't know this until like my last day of doing research because I've been focused so much on absorbing the music that doing my peripheral research into the formation of the band i only just learned that they formed at a mogwai concert which is really funny because there's multiple moments throughout their discography where i'm reminded of mogwai and where i think they take mogwai's kind of quite standard and i love mogwai so i don't say standard in a derogatory way but they take mogwai's standard and established uh idea of post-rock in the late 90s and early 2000s and push it into the progressive sphere in really interesting ways so it's a cool detail that they actually met and kind of bonded over their enjoyment for that particular band before we get into the specific releases that this band kind of put together to start off their career i want to throw over to my special guest today connor who's an equal fan of this band as much as i am is here to help me work through this discography bounce um, thoughts on these albums off of each other and i want to, hear, want to hear from you at this point who are ocean size like what kind of music do ocean size make what do you like ocean size how did you discover them um what do the band mean to you ocean size is quite an interesting band a band that i've loved for many years and if you've seen any other videos that I have been on, I usually say that I discovered a certain artist through the good old Spudnik music, and that is certainly the case for this as well. One of the first 2000s best of album lists that I ever saw, or that was, that really piqued my interest because I didn't really, I hardly knew any of the artists was the Spudnik staff choosing, and they included everyone into position. And I saw that album cover, and I, I I was already a fan of bands that they were compared to, like Porcupine Tree and even Tool. I remember downloading all of their highly rated albums and putting them on my iPod. Yes, iPod, not phone. That's how far back this goes. And I actually, what's funny is I distinctly remember, I don't know if it was the first song that I heard from them, but the first song that like really captured my attention, I remember where I was, and... <laughs> Out of all the places, I was I was cleaning a bathroom, and and I had my headphones on, just shuffling random shit that I downloaded to my phone. And the song that came up was "The Frame," which we will get to for sure. And I, I just remember hearing all of those little details, all these layers of guitar and synth, and you know, really interesting composition. I just couldn't really like believe what I was hearing. It was like. Almost like the fact that I remember hearing this for the first time while cleaning a bathroom, I feel like it says something because otherwise that's something that you probably block out of your memory like <laughs> in the future. But you found anyway. beauty in an ugly place. There you go. There you go. That's exactly it. 
but a- after I got into the song The Frame, I listened to Frames. That was the album that really got me into the band. And then I subsequently listened to all their other stuff. And it- it's just, they're a fascinating band because they're kind of lumped into the 2000s progressive rock camp of bands like, again, Porcupine Tree, Tool, there are other some other bands that I'm not as familiar with, like Amplifier that they're associated with. Uh, there's, uh, I don't know, Richelieu, Fair to Midland, who I like a lot. But the thing is, is like all of those comparisons, all of those similar artists or artists you may also like or fans also like, none of them sound like this band to me. The way that they're able to combine the compositional techniques of progressive rock while still maintaining the patience and massive climaxes of post-rock music, all while also incorporating some like space rock elements. And again, I'm kind of just listing off genres, but like their their influences are so wide ranging that it's really like mind blowing stuff. And it's not just they're not a band that people listen to and just always talk about how talented they are or like they oh, they they don't play in four four. Isn't that so cool? Isn't that so awesome? You know, I I get that like the term progressive rock can or progressive metal can turn off some people because they kind of think of it as like pretentious or more about skill than about, you know, heart, emotional like attachment. More more headless heart. heart sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. But this band is not that. There's plenty of incredibly powerful. I mean, this is a band that has made me cry on multiple occasions. So oh, that yeah. doesn't happen very often. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they really go. they really melted your stone heart. Well, the interesting thing about Ocean Size to me, and one of the things that like immediately sort of gravitated me towards them is yes, how uh skillful they are at executing and composing really great progressive rock songs that you know move through these kind of different shifting parts and have a lot of instrumental interplay and i'm probably going to use the word interplay a lot in this video because that's such a core part of basically every single ocean size song like i said five guys in this band they're each uniquely talented uh three of them are playing guitar on you know a lot of the time basically sometimes simultaneously and so you're having a lot of these dense layers and are often very characterful in their own ways they're sometimes harmonizing. They're a lot of a lot of times providing counterpoint, uh, particularly with uh, drummer Mark Heron, who is often just like completely commanding these songs with these bizarre mm. rhythms that the rest of the band kind of catch up to and kind of start to orient themselves around. There is a lot going on in each of these songs, but one of the things that makes Ocean Size so easy to get into and so compelling and why I think they don't get saddled with a lot of the labels of pretentiousness or of being overwrought or overcomposed or stolid or any of these kinds of negative terms that get thrown a lot of modern progressive music is that there's a really strong melodic core in basically every single Ocean Size song. Mike Vennert is uh, actually really good at writing vocal hooks and at composing vocal melodies that keep you really locked in. And the relationship, and again, interplay between the vocals and the guitar, as well as the rhythm section too, but I'm really going to focus a lot on the vocal and guitar interplay, is so seamless, is so natural feeling that there's an immediacy to all of their songs. It doesn't feel like the kind of cerebral prog rock music where you have to really kind of um, pick apart all the different elements to understand what's meaningful about it. There's an immediacy that comes through because of this sense of harmony that's so strong uh, in Ocean Size's mm-hmm. compositions and particularly in the way that Venner sings alongside his own guitar playing, but the guitar playing of Steve DeRose and uh, Richard Ingram as well. You know, like the, the, that's such a core yeah. part of uh, what Ocean Size mm-hmm. are. And the cool thing about doing an Ocean Size discography video, you know, it makes it slightly less dramatic in its arc, I suppose. But Ocean Size really are just one of those bands that arrived fully formed. Like these guys had all been in other bands beforehand. I mean, bands that they all speak fairly disparagingly about and, you know, aren't particularly proud of. But they have the experience behind them and they came together with this very singular vision of what they wanted to be that resulted in them really not taking very long to find their sound at all 
they named themselves after the Jane's Addiction song, Ocean Size, which is on their first album. And they're influenced a lot by, uh, and I'm going to get into this as we go on, the influence of grunge music and the particular kind of styles of uh, rock music that were taking over in the late 80s and the early 90s as well, that filter through into a lot of their aesthetics, uh, particularly in their early work, I would say, more so than their later work, which they kind of evolve away from that. But um, there is definitely the shadow of grunge and of the post grunge and even new metal eras. I mean, which, you know, they're, they're kind of coming up within that era, to be fair. But the shadow of the music that preceded them is definitely felt in elements of what they do. But of course, the genius of Ocean Size is the way they take those elements and they combine them with different things that you wouldn't normally hear in post grunge or new metal or even grunge and make it feel like it's completely different creation that has this real adherence to and fondness for dreaminess and prettiness and beauty, quite conventional beauty and its approach that those genres kind of quite by definition don't really shoot for very often. Another influence that uh, was really strong on frontman Mike Venner in particular was the band Cardiacs. He is a huge Cardiacs fan, uh, the music of Cardiacs, and particularly the compositional style of Tim Smith. And if you want to hear more detail on that, we did a great video on the Cardiacs masterpiece, Sing to God, which I'll try to remember to link above my head right now. Go and check that out if you're interested or if you're a Cardiacs fan. Tim Smith's particularly maximalist and really kind of uh, intense style as a creative as a composer and as a musician and a performer is something that really filters through into Venert a lot uh, Venert isn't as you know completely obsessed with that maximalism but it's something that you feel you can see come through in a lot of the way that ocean size songs are composed and that influence is kind of there, there's a transmission, I suppose, that's more literal than just, you know, uh, ephemeral because Tim Smith actually produced their Relapse EP, which was their first EP they released while actually signed to a label. They signed to Beggar's Banquet in 2000 uh, after releasing a couple of uh, self self-released EPs. And now most of the songs on these first three EPs will turn up on their first album. There are some other interesting cuts as well, like the title track on Relapse as well as Ebb off of Amputee as well. That are give, are interesting exercises, you know, jam sort of songs that show Ocean Size kind of coming into being and coalescing. But they had a really great sense of, I mean, from the get go, they had a really great sense of how they were going to construct their albums to make sure that the best material gets gets put on and that the structure makes sense to really highlight what is so great about the songs themselves and so in 2003 in september on beggar's banquet we get the debut studio album from ocean size efflores uh, this is also worth noting it is the longest ocean size album which is telling in some respects as well because as ocean size would would go on they would kind of get a better sense of how to hone their records and kind of really I don't want to say trim the fat because this isn't really an album that has fat necessarily, but as they would go on, they would sharpen their skills. And that kind of implies that Eflores is an album that's shaggy. And I don't really think that it is. I think Eflores is an album that is definitely, it feels its length and it goes through this particularly languorous approach where you are really kind of just drifting in a lot of these longer compositions, which tend to be the best tracks on the record, to be fair. Uh, but you also get this great uh, contrast between these longer compositions and these, again, not really short because, you know, songs like Catalyst and um, You Wish are like pushing past the six minute mark. But you are getting these uh, more condensed doses of Ocean Size's progressive bent that are, again, combined and melded with this great sense of melody and even like hookiness that makes the album feel really immediate. I would say that if you are a fan of more traditional progressive rock, I suppose, you know, more like 70s bands like Pink Floyd, for instance, this would be the Ocean Size album I would push you towards first, because I think it is the closest to traditional progressive rock that they ever made. Uh, but it is an album that has a lot of character and idiosyncrasy and uniqueness to it that separates Ocean Size from the pack. Um, Connor, do you want to sort of jump in here with with your kind of overall thoughts on efflores and if you want to um start talking about any songs as well feel free to do that too it's it's kind of become one of my favorite debut albums ever even though it's it's not even my favorite and at this point might and probably not even my second favorite 
ocean size record but it is an incredible way to start a discography you know when you get into the the first song here i am the morning which fun fact is that there is a uh, a russian band i believe they're a post-rock band called are, i am yeah. the morning mm-hmm. yeah that actually got their name from this song another another little interesting fact is the band covet math rock band who is known for yvette young who is a super popular guitarist nowadays that's her band and their their debut full i think it was their debut full length or as an ep whatever it was one of their releases they named that ep after this album f s so even though this is a band that I feel like is not talked about as much as they should be, their influence does carry on to plenty of musicians because you listen to this whole thing and this just showcases how incredibly locked in they are. I Am The Morning starts off as four minute post rock instrumental with different techniques of production. There's a part where when the drums come in, they're like off to one side. Yeah, they're that completely then, in the left and you have like the guitar completely yeah. in the right. And it's kind of jarring uh, the way how kind of boldly they use panning right from the jump in this song. But it like, and it's a very sort of simple song. It kind of, again, it's something that they won't, mm-hmm. they don't really do on any of their other albums, which is just have an, an intro song, uh, an opening track, which is just purely an intro just exists really to kind of let the record begin and it has a very sort of like yeah. satisfying kind of um natural and quite basic sort of chord progression that it really leans into and uses panning and layering and the gradual addition of each member of the band to kind of emphasize the power of what you're about to hear basically yeah when i see, when i see this album cover the the main melody of this song even though it's far from the highlight of this album for me just that do 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 do, 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 do. like i just hear that just looking at the cover and i think even though again it's probably my least favorite opener it doesn't really say much because it's a really great like teaser to be like okay this is what we're about and then of mm-hmm. course leads incredibly well into the second track catalyst, catalyst. baby like oh yeah um... <laughs> on this song is just completely addictive like you've got yeah. again i hate to kind of lean into very obvious and and kind of caveman brain aspects of what make early ocean size work so well but a lot of the time you just are bowled over by how good the riffs are and how well mm-hmm. they're delivered um yeah interplay and all those kind of aspects of how the different guitarists kind of play off each other is an awesome an integral part of it as well but sometimes you just get a fucking sick ass riff like the one in this song and you just yeah. get to fucking actually like i'm gonna make this comparison a lot and these this is obviously and you've already actually made it so you've kind of set mm-hmm. this up for me a band that i think of a lot when i listen to to ocean size particularly early ocean size is porcupine tree so yeah. much of uh the sounds of these records are really, really similar to me to the sounds of records like End Absentia and Lightbulb Sun and Deadwing. Like, there's so much shared DNA there. Obviously, you know, Porcupine Tree, also an English progressive rock band coming up around the same time. Stephen Wilson would go on to say that Everyone in Two Position and Frames are two of his favorite albums of the 2000s. Huge Mm -hmm. fan, a lot of kinship there. But specifically, when I listen to this album as well, which came out only a year after In Absentia, I'm reminded so much of different moments on that album that where Ocean Sides are channeling the same energy, like sonically and in the way that they use riffs as well. You get a really cool riff, like the one in Catalyst, that's kind of like kind of doing a start stop thing, kind of going forward and then kind of ca- sort of doubling back. And then you get it the you get that a few times and you get a kind of like uh you know expansion on that musical idea that kind of explodes it and sort of takes it somewhere completely different and you kind of come back to the riff and it's it's so good the way they do that yeah the guitar work in just like the first couple like first minute of the song like the way it just starts out with just a a flurry of noise and then like i i always really love the part before the main riff where they're just doing those like chuggy mutes that are just like like and they're they're all three doing it at different places so it's like bouncing around your head mm. like and then they go into that main riff which i always this song in particular i always it actually really this whole album a lot of the heavy riffs really remind me of like 90s like post hardcore adjacent stuff like absolutely um like quicksand or even hum especially on this song 
especially when they're playing that main riff and then a clean guitar comes in which is a weird choice but it like that clean arpeggio like man that's, it's just like that wow. that that to me like that decision is p- mm-hmm. like so ocean science like they do that kind of yes. thing so much where, you, where you'll have that counterpoint you'll have a, a heavy main focus but you'll have this dreamy element that's coming in and either doing harmony or counterpoint or sometimes both of those things and yeah, mm-hmm. hum is a really great reference point as well. I'm annoyed I didn't think of them in my when I was preparing notes for this because yeah, they're totally taking a lot of pages out of that book. They're more tied to this kind of more immediate and more multifaceted sound than hum, who are kind of a lot of the time we're just about the wall of sound thing. But yeah, yeah, I mean that's what is so special about ocean size is they can evoke that wall of sound heaviness but they'll only do that for so long before they throw in mm-hmm. like two or three or four different things to add this dynamic range to it like there's this dreamy instrumental breakdown that happens about two-thirds of the way into the song that kind of uh is like going back and forth between the heavy crunching parts and it's this like loud quiet dynamic thing that obviously part of the mogwai influence as well because that was something that mogwai were well known for also again super in absentia as well i keep thinking of songs like wedding mm-hmm. nails and strip the soul off of that album which yeah. is again so similar to this and then they use this kind of dynamic interplay to build the song back up and then when the drums come in fully you get this like screaming feedback solo at the end i love i love yeah. i actually feel bad because i don't know uh wh- which of the guitarists t- tend to typically do the more sort of um you know textural stuff versus like the kind of main lead stuff but whoever is doing the kind of the feedback stuff is just like absolutely killing it because it's just this massive climax of the song reaches and you're just kind of being kind of just pushed into this ugly sound uh before the song just kind of cuts away it's so good catalyst i think is one of the best songs to just get started to like get into this band like I feel like if you're really into the more like alt metal sound or post like kind of post hardcore kind of stuff, this is a great choice to lead off because it's catchy too. And I think this is one of Mike Venart's best vocal performances, especially like when that, I think it's the second chorus when that finally comes in and he's like, just, he's just wailing. Like he's just, he's got so much range that one, yeah. that one part where he just like screams and he like, you hear his voice yeah. like scratch against the mix on that one line. And then you kind of yeah. compare that to the sort of main verse melody where he's kind of singing quite soulfully and he's kind of like ringing in this sort of slightly sort of mid range register. And it's very melodic. He does that mm-hmm. so much as well. And I think early in this early era as well, he's especially leaning into that like hard contrast sort of thing where you where he's really doing one thing and then the complete opposite thing. Um, and, and again, as Ocean Tires would go on, they would get more sort of, uh, I guess, tasteful and more sort of um, just adept at blending the different kind of ends of their dynamic range together to make it feel sort of more dreamy and more kind of like it all melds into one whereas early on in these first two records especially you get a lot of hard contrasts i mean particularly Mm -hmm. let me think about the way this song ends and then the twinkly melody that opens up one day all this could be yours as well which is like again so i yeah, it reminds me of Porcupine Tree. It reminds me of a whole bunch of different things I can't quite um, even name off the top of my head, but it's just this eerie, but it's this pretty sound that has this kind of eeriness to it, especially when you get that kind of purring synthetic bass tone at the start of the song that mm. is just so like, it, it provides this amazing, this great bedrock. And then this the 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 vocal tone from Venner as well on this song is super Stephen Wilson, especially that kind of like yeah. muted sort of almost speaking thing that he does as he's kind of going through the lyrics of this song. Beautiful track. There's a couple times on this album where Venner does like kind of a false, like a wide stereo, like falsetto harmony with himself that I'm like porcupine tree right there yeah like and i know and i I know i said beforehand that like i i I, we want to stress the fact that these guys are not just like porcupine tree proteges or whatever like they have their own very distinct sound that they go for but there's Mm. there's just a lot of like little things that you can hear especially if you're already 
a massive porcupine tree fan and you go into these guys and you're yeah, like, yeah, I mean, I just can't yeah, help can but make that. the comparisons because they were like oh, yeah, really yeah. one of my favorite bands in general before I ever heard an Ocean Size album. So it's just such mm-hmm. a reference point to me for so much of this modern brand of Prague, especially coming out of England. Um, yeah. But this song as well, One Day All This Could Be Yours, also kind of introduces a core aspect of Venert and his writing specifically that will come up a lot, which is the theme of uh, fatherhood and specifically kind of neglectful fatherhood or this idea of being raised or being set up, whether it's actually in the context of fatherhood or just in the context of, you know, the world itself and the way the world does or doesn't prepare you for how in difficult life will be this idea. So there's a lot of ideas of sort of empty promises and of sort of being left behind and left to sort of fend for yourself in a kind of cold and uncaring world. Uh, that really comes through here lyrically, and it's something Venert will talk about a lot throughout these albums in different ways. Yeah, I think Venert is like, of course, the main thing that we're stressing is just how fantastic the musicianship and composition is, and dynamics as well. But like, Venert is a, a really good vocalist and writer, and I think he really shows that on this record. 100%. I, my attention always at least is always kind of flitting between a lot of what Venert is doing vocally and lyrically how he emphasizes certain lines and then just the Im- immense sound of the band as well and nowhere is that better shown really like that the skill of Venert as a writer and as a performer and how the rest of the band can like kind of completely uh just take the composition with through his guidance to some amazing places then with the fourth track here, Massive Bereavement, you know, it's like, it's oh, yeah. exactly 10 minutes and it's just incredible. It represents this, again, this is the kind of um, flex move you do when you're releasing a 75 minute album is you can have these multiple different crest points throughout the runtime that the record kind of builds to and that represent the kind of heights and then the album sort of settles down from there and builds up to the next sort of big climactic section and uh, I know it's hard to tell whether there's any track that has as much weight and as much kind of like power and all of its different varied sections and the entire discography as this one does, especially kicking off with that super dreamy swirling section reminds me of Radiohead a little bit, uh, but you yeah. have more of that very clever um and just very sort of su- well not quite subtle because it's not that subtle but like you have the panning is such a big part of the way that this early section sounds overlaid guitar lines but one is panned slightly to the left and one is panned slightly to the right so that really allows you to kind of pick up on the interplay between these different lines that the guitars are doing and again you have this continuation of the lyrical theme here as well this idea of a neglected child's resentment rising as he's sort of reaching out to try and connect with the world i mean this song is there's so much to talk about with this song connor where do you begin yeah first of all this is one of the greatest songs of the 2000s easily easily like if this song does not convince you of how amazing this band is then i I don't know if anything will because like you were saying those clean guitars it's a very like clean sound but it's there's a lot of tension like i don't feel like that they have some songs that have a more traditional melody that we'll get into like you know a song like music for a nurse but a song like this it has this like psychedelic tension i don't know how to describe it but that's a great way of describing it yeah and the way like venart finds this weird melody over the top of it and because you know going into it that it's 10 minutes you have this feeling that it's going to build into something and also of course the panned drums on this track just Mm. sound amazing like i think they're double tracked and put into each ear and it's just like it's such a captivating song because it's 10 minutes of rising anxiety And just this feeling of like tension that continues building and building and building and building. And even at the climax of the song, it doesn't even, you don't even really get a resolution of that tension. It just has kind of escalated and gotten so frantic to the point where you are just in a really loud, a really intense space. It's really, really masterful how it's crafted to kind of pull you through this place. And even when the song kind of does switch kind of quite dramatically in its final third, Mm -hmm. it still feels as though it's a natural escalation of the tension that's been built up so far. You know, Venet's 
being playful here as well, particularly with the, you know, is this not what you expected vocal part that oh, yeah. kind of int- introduces that kind of main sort of swirling, circling, cyclical, uh, heavy guitar riff section. I mean, when that kind of heavy riff sort of first comes in, listen to the way that the distorted uh, guitar in the background kind of keeps screeching as that's happening as well. There's so much happening at any given moment in these pieces that you your brain is so overwhelmed the first time you hear it, even the first few times you hear it, but you've always got one thing to hold on to that makes it satisfying so that when you come back to it in the future, you have enough of a connection to it because of those few elements, whether it's the riffs or whether it's the vocal melodies or whatever, that you start noticing the other things that you didn't notice the first time. And that just makes it even more uh, fascinating and even more like impressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just, I, I am so taken away by how intense this song is its entire time but the nature and the tone of that intensity changes as the composition changes i mean the the intensity and attention rises so much over such a long period of time that the entire final minute of this song is just completely overwhelming like it's just entirely consuming like no matter what i'm doing when i get to the final minute of massive bereavement I can't focus on anything else or I need mm-hmm. to like stop what I'm doing. Otherwise I'll like, you know, I, I might start hyperventilating if I'm trying to do like three different things while this is playing, because it's just, it gets to the point where it's so all consuming in a way that, you know, ocean size have plenty of, of moments throughout their discography where you are really taken away by how intense and heavy things have gotten, but maybe none that are this, just completely balls to the wall and as the final minute of this song i mean Mm -hmm. i mean that title of massive bereavement like that the idea of like overwhelming all-consuming grief you know that that really feels as though it's an energy you can pick up on from the 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 you know it's the idea of this emotion or the state of being that is slowly taking you over to the point where it is all you are basically yeah that's so powerful and you're just at the very end you're just dropped into this abyss where you're floating with the song rinsed which is i have to say one of my Mm -hmm. favorite interludes on any album ever like it is just an interlude It, it is purely there for structural reasons to give you a very necessary moment to breathe after massive bereavement but even aside from that I just adore the sound design and the just everything about this song. Like the first time you hear the album, you're so overwhelmed by massive bereavement. You don't really process rinsed because it is just Mm -hmm. there purely functionally. But if you, when you actually sit down to listen to this, there's so much happening in this. It's hypnotic, but it's so intricately crafted with so much detail. There's these wandering sort of floaty and twanging guitar parts that are giving so much color. There's that really steady and memorable bass part from John Ellis, which is essentially the whole song. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple. Like it's basically just two notes on the bass. They sound so hypnotic and huge. And it's just this... Oh, it, the the feeling this gives me is it, it's overwhelming like massive bereavement has been in a completely different way in a way where I'm just totally yeah. immersed in this soundscape mm. you know it, it's it's so brilliant <laughs> and no one ever talks about it because it's just an yeah. inter- interlude this is one of the things that I love so much about this band is you get a song like massive bereavement 10 minutes multiple changes multiple sections a lot so much to take in it, it just shows that they're willing to like take a step back when they need to you know mm-hmm. they're not just trying to impress you they're not just trying to throw everything that they got right in your face they're like okay let's let's take it back down a notch mm-hmm. and then we'll lead into the next track like it seems so simple when you're listening to it but it's really just masterful album construction like i've seen a lot of people say that i you know 
not really with regard to any particular ocean size album but just that their albums can be too much or that they, they're too long the records are over long or you know this song didn't need to be here or or this is you know less impressive than this and and just feels like filler or yada 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 no real appreciation for what each song they include on all of their albums is doing structurally for the pacing of the album and yeah. i think ocean size are really a band where the album experience is so key like yeah there are a few mm-hmm. odd individual songs throughout their discography that can be fully appreciated in isolation but so much of what makes ocean size work is how masterful they are at album construction for the most part they're so good at making each choice that they make feel as though it's a natural it naturally evolves out of the last choice or is a natural response to the last choice and they do they're really good at doing this within their long compositions but also just between songs as well it really really fits and they would find more elegant ways to kind of give you a come down from than just having a separate interlude track they'd find more elegant ways of giving you counterpoint and contrast on their subsequent records but i love the you know sort of more traditional prog feel that i get from this uh by having separate interludes by having these distinct moments that are there to just bring you uh down and settle you and, and prepare you for whatever's next that feels very true to the spirit of 70s prog uh which i had which is very mm-hmm. close to my heart and you know you've had these riff centric and very sort of dynamic but musically focused uh songs for the for the most part and then you get three uh i don't want to say conventional but sort of comparatively more conventional and straightforward rock songs and and you wish remember where you are in amputee that form the kind of midsection of the record and uh connor what do you think about these songs <clears throat> you wish is one of my favorite ocean side songs again I'll, i'm gonna say that a lot because their discography is relatively short and they have and they're filled to the brim with highlights each and every album spoiler alert we love every album but you wish in particular i just it 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 it, again when you're talking about like perfect album sequencing the way that the really chilled soft atmospheric atmosphere of rinse kind of leads nicely into the almost math rock influenced verses of you wish and then that chorus comes in um man what one of their best choruses and one of venard's best performances the way he's like say yeah and then at the end where he's like get up incredible he's just like screaming and it's yeah i I have to say and this is just kind of more, I guess, my childhood coming out. Whenever he sings uh, Save Me, I'm a Danger to Myself, I always think of uh, Pink's Don't Let Me Get Me, you know, where the chorus is, I'm a hazard to myself. And that <laughs> song came out like a year before this album. So like part of me wonder, wonders <laughs> whether Vino is like subconsciously had that stuck in his head when he wrote this. I want to believe like when... that's true because it would be an amazing yeah. co- collision of worlds. It's but like it kinda... how, it's like how sorry it's like how kelly clarkson was in clearly influenced by the dismemberment plan <laughs> <laughs> well like it's funny because like since you've been gone is like max martin is deliberately uh trying to make a stroke song that's good enough to be on you know the top of the charts anyway um what was i going to say uh, but yeah that, <laughs> that pink connection or that like vague reminder that this chorus gives me of an actually huge 2002 pop song is i guess also a tribute to how good venert is at crafting catchy vocal hooks again it's not like something that's gonna you know it's not like top 40 material it's not gonna be something that you you know are unable to get out of your head forever but it is just a really satisfying moment that the song builds to a really satisfying release you get with that chorus And I'm just like really, this is one of the moments on the album as well where I'm really struck by how much the general tone, particularly in the guitar, but also just in the the vocals and the construction of the song in general reminds me of grunge like specifically i think of soundgarden mm. a lot when i listen to this song yeah. uh, Bennett's vocal was kind of cornell-esque in in parts of this song although of course he doesn't have cornell's range because who the fuck does but it's just some of the the, the intensity reminds me of that and there's just sort of some kim thale-esque qualities to the guitar tones in this love that i love 
how then this is the prevailing aspect of the midsection of the record to me is it's where i think that influence of 90s grunge and sort of that more popular side of rock music in the 90s still alternative but still more kind of crossing over into the mainstream comes through uh, it's also true of remember where you are which is slightly more musically intricate you have this sort of lighter touch to the drumming with these like really delicate fills that provide great counterpoint to these very steady arpeggiated chords it is a song that is a bit strange structurally like the sudden stop of the single bite of cherry always kind of throws me uh in this song but the mm. the way that after the, each of those moments within the song uh you get a kind of uh, moving forward of the general musical idea once the song comes back in uh, does make it satisfying it shifts into this strange eerie final stretch that feels really unexpected but sets up the arrival of the amputee just beautifully which is i think not my absolute favorite song on this album but i think like one of the most representative of how powerful and how talented ocean size were and what they're going for with this particular era as well like this is one of the first songs that they released anyway and you can tell that they must have been particularly proud of it and that it must have felt like a particular achievement when this song was finished because it is one of the greatest hooks that venus ever sung it is one of the greatest mm -hmm. lead guitar lines on any ocean size song it is just a perfect song in general and this would be the one yep. from this record i would i would i would show to people who are new to this band to get them really hooked because everything that's great about ocean size is here yes it's less complex and multifaceted and it's general construction but there's still so much going on that makes it hit really hard yeah again those screeching guitar leads that just open it straight away mm. like you said this is one of their best and catchiest choruses as well and I always love the the post chorus, like wherever that part where the extremely like almost abrasively loud wah wah guitar comes in, it just it just extends that massive chorus even further. This is like the one of the most maybe even even the most anthemic ocean size songs I think. Absolutely. It has a fairly like conventional structure compared to a lot of ocean size songs as well. I mean, plenty of them do the verse chorus verse thing, but this one feels like it's sort of easier to get a handle on uh, than a lot of their other songs, but still you have multiple choruses. Still, you have a song that the song's still changing and evolving and introducing new things as it goes on as well. Uh, particularly, I love that shift when you get into the um, keep pushing back and we'll come up roses part and towards the end as well. Yeah. And, and like another reason why I think this is like an ideal ocean, like one of the ideal ocean size songs as well is that you get, uh, thematically in Venus lyricism as well, a continuation of the idea of sort of suffering within the family unit as well, or being trapped within this kind of cons construct of uh, Western society or of the, the place that you live in essentially that allows for a kind of systematic abuse or even just a systematic neglect that leaves you kind of helpless essentially. And it's a theme that he's quite passionate about and sometimes kind of quite angry about as well. Um, but this is a song that has so much sadness in it um so much sadness but also so much like of a striving for better as well especially with that you know there's got to be something better than this that he continues coming back to and that you know not a lot of venet songs that deal explicitly with these themes have that sense of hope in them or have that sense of just pushing back against the suffering that this one does but i think that's the kind of the cherry on top that makes it feel like because you can sing along to that chorus and really feel it and really feel yeah whatever the fuck he's talking about there has to be something better than this for sure mm -hmm. um and that's yeah. just such a an awesome part of it i do think that right. the only relatively substantially weak moment on the record is unravel it's slightly less fitting or it's just slightly more kind of obviously there structurally than rinsed is mm -hmm. and the the piano loop itself i find a little bit kind of you know just a lot of the elements of this interlude i think feel very of, of its time and kind of just a little bit rote uh, there's enough detail in here to make it kind of stand out there's some um, distortion electronic haze and there's sort of subtle electronic elements and distortion that do kind of color across this album um, you get it a little bit more prominently here um, it's a nice palette cleanse. It doesn't feel like as necessary of a palette cleanse as rinsed is, but basically you're just setting up or preparing yourself mentally for 
the mm. incredible final trio of songs on oh, this yeah. album, which, you know, I said to you the other day, like sometimes I just listen to these last three songs, like as a, a self-contained EP, because I feel like they work yeah. like that, especially because they don't run into each other per se, but they have this kind of flow where it's very difficult to listen to any of them without the other two. Um, surrounding them to, to me it's just this one sort of extended almost 30 minute stretch of music that is all consuming like while i'm listening mm. to it i'm completely enveloped in these songs i i made this comparison before and going back to like progressive rock progressive metal comparisons to me this these last three songs are kind of like the funeral bastard death of music that uh Devin Townsend did on the Ocean Machine album like that's what this remind even though that it sounds nothing like that that's what this reminds me of just ending with the three like just powerhouses of tracks and it's mm. just it's something my, else I mean. my reference point is even more like far further afield but I think of like uh what Yola Tingo did on their album Popular Songs uh, which came way later than this anyway, but uh, they did the same thing where um, they end with three like extremely long songs that kind of just let you kind of get the most indulgent version of the band, but also like give you this immensely emotional experience that you are kind of primed for considering how much the album is given to you up to that point. Women who love men who love drugs, you know, aside, let's just ignore the fact that the title is meaningless and stupid. Like one of the mm -hmm. dumbest titles for one of the most beautiful songs of all time. But oh, that yeah. said, that's kind of fitting because like Mogwai do that a lot. They'll have the most absolutely brain dead, completely stupid titles for songs that are just like brain bustingly beautiful. It's kind of like an in-joke in a lot of post-rock and, and math rock and hardcore music as well as let's just give a really stupid title to a piece of music that's just completely stunning. Um, yeah. But this is the most beautiful song Ocean Size ever put out, in my opinion. I think it's one of the most beautiful prog rock songs ever. Uh, the longing watery mm. guitar tones are impossibly sad you know lyrically it's basically meaningless but it's purely a stage for this band's immaculately interconnected jamming and you really do feel like you're just getting to witness this gorgeous jamming exploration where every single musical idea that each band member introduces throughout the eight nine minutes of the song feels like one of the most beautiful things you've ever heard one thing that i haven't really touched or talked about as much in regards to the guitar work on any ocean size album is the use of effects. And this is one of the best examples specifically of their love of phaser or phasing effects, which like right from the beginning. And when those, when the drums come in, you hear that guitar come in. That's just like, Oh God, I just get chills every time I hear the song. Like, and then the way like, Again, like you said, the lyrics are essentially meaningless. And uh, what I read is that he was influenced by the uh, untitled album of Sigaros, who we mentioned earlier as part of one of the Discog uh, reviews. Go watch that. The lyrics on that album don't really mean much or really anything, but it's like he, he heard that and it was like, well, yeah. as long as the music is this beautiful, does it really even matter? It reminds me of Sigur Ross. It also reminds me of Explosions in the Sky as well. Like their characteristic yeah. guitar tone is very similar mm -hmm. to the tone that they use on this song. And again, it's like a lot of what was quite popular and quite fashionable in post-rock at the era that this album was made. And it's such a treat because Ocean Size don't allow themselves to kind of purely jam with this very soft and beautiful sound you know all that often yeah it gets heavy at certain points as well but not in the same way as the as most of the rest of the album it just feels like the intensity of the beauty is being upped but nothing is being kind of like you know upended or or you know changed in any kind of dramatic way it's just a series of gorgeous wonderful ideas that just are totally hypnotic and and beautiful you know it feels like an, uh, watching the night sky and seeing comets streaking across it you know, it, it, it's it's stunning. I mean, the the vocal and guitar interplay here as well, like especially with how 
again, how sort of like languorous uh, Venet's delivery is, just really hanging on these single words and long tones and giving you like almost doing the work of the of the bass, basically, almost doing the work of kind of a foundation, even though the bass playing from John Ellis is also great here anyway, just giving you this bedrock for these beautiful twinkling tones to feel even more astonishing is amazing. Mm-hmm. And eh, what's funny is that like it these three songs at the end very much feel like of a piece and they all feel distinct in their own ways. But in a lot of ways, women who love men and long forgotten just sort of feel like extended intro and outro respectively for a Saturday morning breakfast show, which is like the Mm -hmm. fullest and most dynamic composition of these three and a song that completely fucking bowls me over. Uh, Just it's yeah. pure ocean size. It's the other only other moment besides massive bereavement where you really get this extended jam that cycles through different ideas, starts in one place, has this kind of um, you know, sort of un- gets kind of undercut by this completely different section and then kind of returns to um something else, something more familiar than gives it a new spin astonishing i love the way that again producer chris sheldon who is going to be mentioned many times as well because he um, produced i'm Mm -hmm. pretty sure three of the four ocean size albums uh his work with kind of melding this in from the end of the previous song is beautiful there's this incredible midsection with this very steady drum part and these kind of swooning wordless vocals these that i yeah swear to god is taken directly from Pearl Jam's Oceans off of their teen album. Like it's the same vocal mm. melody as the bridge in that song. Like I've compared them before and it's like, it's, it's definitely intentional. And I love that because I love Pearl Jam. I love Oceans. It's one of those underrated deep cuts on 10. And again, it feels very truthful. Like a, a moment where the band are acknowledging the influence of nineties alternative music on what they do and how it is such a core flavor that makes the the way they infuse it with prog music feel so novel and feel so exciting. And what are your thoughts on this song? Again, another one of my favorite songs they've ever made. I get kind of like a old blues type sound with the beginning of the song. Mm-hmm. And then when the toms come in, like build in that. The, the drumming is so just, good here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then again, that one section where he's just like singing falsetto, like, and that that when that part comes in that just sends the song like over the top for me that part and then the part where the song gets really really heavy and essentially is doing that same vocal melody but the guitars are doing it but they're like layering it in distortion and the drums are kind of like you know doing this kind of double time thing that's amazing (laughs) it's not necessarily my number one favorite song on this album but i think it's one of along with like Mass Abreement, the most impressive song mm. on this album. Because it just goes to show like how completely almost borderline disconnected some of these sections can sound in isolation if you just like skip around. Um, but then when you listen to it all the way through, it's just so seamless. You you don't even... And to the point where during like the last minute where it goes back into that loud like octave guitar screeching moment and it's like oh wow this is the same song or like it's yeah mm. it, it's just kinda, mind-blowing stuff kind of crazy like the first release they ever put out was a split single or was a sorry a double-sided single which included this song uh in a different form admittedly like it was re-recorded and kind wow. of expanded a little bit uh for this album but it's interesting like seeing how they take this essentially like quite basic exercise in post rock and adapt it and shift it and and contextualize it and flesh it out into this massive piece of uh, multifaceted music that feels like it couldn't belong anywhere else other than right here at the climax of this record. And it basically leaves mm-hmm. Long Forgotten, the closing track, feeling basically just like an epilogue, more so than an actual closer. It's just a final come down again. It's an indulgent album. It, it allows itself the right to have these extended pieces that function more as sort of uh, emotional sort of bits of breathing room or reflection rather than just like integral core pieces. But this is a brilliant song still all the same. Yeah. The way the cello comes in early on at the start, mm-hmm. just kind of oozing this regret and loneliness 
Once again, you have this very Steve Wilson influenced vocal tone in the song. Uh, he has Steve Wilson both in his solo work and his Porky Punch. He has a lot of songs that sound like this, this really melancholic loneliness as well. I mean, Venner is, has dropped a lot of his abstraction and is really just sort of talking about being really sad and really alone and really missing someone. And there's like the stillness at the center of the song as well that brings it to this almost slow core tempo before the bass line comes in and the tone shifts it to something, again, more unexpected, more intricate, more progressive in the final mm -hmm. stretch. What a beautiful way to end the album, man. Yeah, just a stunning track just all the way through. One of the best, probably one of my favorite like post-rock songs ever. The way the strings like fully like envelop the last section of the song just gives me chills every time and the way that it like the the bass line that you were taught that you were referencing just comes in where it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. like yeah i mean again we're i can't like emphasize how amazing like every part on every album is with this band but like come on man it's so good as i was saying before like this yeah. final three song stretch it is like basically it feels like one extended composition where you have these two post-rock bookends that and and saturday morning breakfast show is kind of like the central meat that gives you all the progressive stuff like you can view this if you take a step back you can view this whole last 30 minutes as just being one continuous um swelling piece that just vacillates through these different stages you know another one of my recent discoveries that's kind of becoming one of my absolute favorite albums of all time, which is Cult of Lunas Somewhere Along the Highway, also does this. You know, it has a final, you know, stretch of of three songs that essentially comp comprise like 30 plus minutes of music that go through very distinct stages, but feel like this one single piece that you just get swallowed by uh, in the final stretch of the album. Mm. I love when bands allow themselves to do that. And especially when they have the talent to pull it off as well and have it not just feel like, you know, the album is sort of being padded out uh, towards its end. I mean, this is Ocean's Eyes are not a band that front load the best material. Like they're so yeah. good at rewarding you from, for sticking with their albums. Not that it ever feels like a chore to do that, but they are really, really good at giving you something that feels as though it's worth the wait uh, when, when you get to mm -hmm. that final stretch. And look, that is, that is Eflores, man. That is their yeah. debut. It is, you know, it is probably the shaggiest and certainly the most indulgent ocean size album i think by definition it sort of has to be you know it's it's an archetypal debut in that sense that even though they are a band that arrived fully formed and it's an incredible album it certainly is one where they allow themselves certain you know small but still noticeable indulgences uh that they would definitely trim on their uh future records but you know it also gives it this extra flair and attitude that again i think people who are fans of traditional prog and who like those kinds of indulgences it'll really appeal to them uh people who i suppose have more defined tastes and are more discerning uh and and kind of quite critical of structure maybe won't enjoy this as much as a record like frames but still i think it's an obviously an essential part of ocean size's story and an album that definitely took a bit longer to grow on me than uh, every one into position and frames did, which is probably just a, a product of the fact that I listened to it after those two. And so wasn't expecting something comparatively more traditional, I suppose, but it definitely has gotten to the point now where I completely adore this through and through hundred mm -hmm. percent all the way. <laughs> yeah. And again, the fact that we've been talking about it for this much and, it's not even either of our favorite album from this band just goes to show how incredible they were. Absolutely. And Ocean Size would waste no time in building on it. In between the release of Eflores and their second album, Ocean Size released the music for Nurse's EP. Now they released a number of different EPs in their career, but this is probably the most notable one. It's material that's entirely unique to this EP as well, as opposed to other EPs, which include songs that would simply feature on albums that would be more fully formed in those places. The music for Nurse's EP is unquestionably its own distinct statement in the discography of Ocean Size. Um, Connor, what are your overall thoughts on this EP? This has become one of my absolute favorite EPs ever. It's five songs, but 
I kind of think of it as three songs with the last three being like one gigantic suite. I agree. Um, it's one of the most airtight, incredible EP. It really does sound like the midway point be- between the more raw, proggy sound of Eflores and the more aggressive metal sound of everyone to position, especially with the opening track, One Out of None, which is mm. an incredible opener. That that one's my favorite song on this. I just love oh, yeah. how, again, genuinely incredibly heavy this is. There's so much dynamic intensity, and there's a great use of dynamic shifts through the song as well, like the steady surges of the riff and the uses of silence to break them up. There's really cool details here, like the piano that comes in to do harmony with the main melodic guitar part about halfway through. The main guitar part itself, which eventually gets its own layered harmony, is so nice. And then that sustained vocal note finale is just so awesomely intense. It's just like, what a way to kick the door down on a release, even a shorter one. The way he screams on some of their more aggressive songs, this is one of the best examples when he's like screaming, Ah, Sals! Ah, Sals! Yeah! About have our sales. Like, so good. That, that part just gets me going. Like, man... What a way to start this EP out. It's just incredible. Yeah, 100%. I want to throw some appreciation out there for Paper Champion as well, which is the more sort of, I guess, subtle song on this EP in terms of its approach, a bit more intricacy in its composition, a bit less like break the door down heavy, more focus on melodics and these sort of gentle surges and swells. The bass is wonderful in this song. The midsection Mm. does this great part where it sort of cuts these distorted like segments in between these little pieces of guitar noodling. I really love that. Again, the panning, the use of space is stellar. This song almost sounds a little slightly industrial at moments with it's like punchy percussion and like the noisy guitar bits that just kind of interweave throughout these beautiful echo laden guitars. I just, I love the, whatever delay they use on the main guitar of the and it's just like it's so long that it lasts throughout like the whole measure and it's like yeah the, it, it's an incredible song even like if, if you consider this ep to be like three songs this is my least favorite of the three but it's still a major highlight i just my favorite the, the best the characteristic of this ep that most sums out what i think makes it amazing is atmosphere like it's yeah. so atmospheric like you get so much heft and presence and, and really driving you know core musical parts but they never abandon the sense of really dense atmosphere that makes it such an immersive experience as well and really is a core part of that final suite too it leads really nicely into the, the last three songs as a whole easily one of my favorite songs that they've ever made you have Drag the Nile, which is just like pretty much ambient, uh, like an ambient pad intro leading into Dead Dogs and All Sorts. Very pleasant title. This song right here is one of the major highlights on the EP for me. The very beginning sounds, to me, sounds a lot like Boris Feedbacker. Mm. Like it really it gives off kind of that dark, subtle atmosphere that you don't really know what's going to happen. And then... Mark Heron as well. The drummer is doing amazing work in this early section as well. Again, he's got a little bit of a jazzy quality to it. He loves to introduce these unconventional sort of um, styles and approaches that he takes to the drumming, really drives the core of the song. And you just have this this rise in intensity that happens that's so organic and so like subtle and hypnotic. It's so easy to sort of lose yourself in the way this builds. And we talk we talk about builds and climaxes all throughout because again, there's this is a band that is has a very strong post rock connection, so they're gonna have that. But we can't stress the enough how amazing they are at it, especially the ending of this song, where Ven Art's just like just wailing these lines, these final lines, and the guitars are just this. The guitars and drums are just it's like a it's like a blizzard just going right in your face like it's and then the way that leads into the last incredible closing track Mm. um as the smoke clears which has have these like super low heavy 
metal hits that are just like don't don't like contrast is the key in this final track i think for me again dynamic contrast loud mm-hmm. and quiet there's contrast in the lyrics between lines like speak with what eloquence you can muster versus three lines later just scream aloud and prove everyone right i, I love that <laughs> sense yeah. of like um you know the having a facade and then throwing it away essentially again great mirroring between lyrics and what the song is doing musically towards the final stretch these intense surges run into these bent riffs and again insane fills like this might be some of mark mm-hmm. heron's best work with ocean size as a drummer just on this ep so much of what he is doing is like the driving force and the most memorable part of these songs to me and then before it all just kind of melts into feedback incredible incredible track just so much to take in but again it gives you that space it gives you that atmosphere it gives you that sense of just foreboding that makes it irresistible and so charismatic of a release really stands out has its own personality yeah it's just incredible it's everything that i want in an all-time favorite ep of mine Mm, 100 percent and then only one year later, and the band would be back with their second full-length studio album, Everyone Into Position, which absolutely capitalizes in so many respects on all the strengths of this record and pushes the band's progressive tendencies to stratospheric new heights. You have with this album a lot more eclectic experimentation and a lot more pushing against the boundaries of traditional prog structure but the other side of the coin is you have a lot more idiosyncrasy, you have a lot more character, you have a lot more distinctive, uh, pure ocean size stuff that you couldn't recognize for any other band. Everyone in Two Position is a flooring album. I feel like it's probably the album that most people who discover Ocean Size hear first. It's because I think it seems to be the most kind of conventionally agreed to be the most sort of popular uh, album of theirs. You know, between the more traditional beginnings of Eflores and the perfectly refined progressive perfection of frames. It is this kind of middle child that's more rambunctious, noisier, you know, not afraid to be a little bit more outlandish, but also so completely driven by the this desire and this need to exist that the other Ocean Size albums don't quite have to the same extent. And what I mean by that is that it is an intensely political album and it has this ferocious energy and this anger to it that no other Ocean Size album has. Obviously, a lot of that comes from Venert, his lyricism. So much of it is based around obvious, clear rage at the Bush Blair years, you know, the, the particular era of warmongering, particularly in Iraq, that this album is obviously coming out in amongst the the height of. And obviously a lot of rock bands were making records and were making music that was a very direct response to that. And it's such a core and fundamental aspect of this album that even if you aren't the kind of person who pays attention to the lyrics, you kind of can't ignore it because this is an angry angry fucking album it's an intensely emotional record in so many different respects yes there's anger there's a lot of sadness there's a lot of regret there's a lot of intense emotions and very few of them get clear resolution either so there's a different kind of tension to this record than some than some of the more compositional tension of Evres. there's this sense of nervous energy that this thing has that makes for some of the most explosive moments on any ocean size album this is i would say the loudest and most intense ocean size record as well i'm pretty sure it's the only one that chris sheldon didn't produce so it has this and because chris sheldon brings this i suppose tasteful smoothness to the the mixing and the style of the way that the instruments all come together on the other ocean size albums this one's slightly just more rough around the edges slightly grittier as well and it's a particular character that really complements the feel of the album and the the tone of the compositions themselves. Uh, Connor, what are your overall thoughts on everyone into position? You can get into uh, the songs themselves if you want to. In terms of the big three, this one actually took me the longest to get into. Um, Not that I didn't already love it, but I think because I was so into frames, which again is more post-rock and like has a lot more like beautiful somber moments than a lot of their other records it's got that tortoise influence and like that 90s post-rock influence that really none of their other albums have and we'll get to that when we talk about it 
Oh yeah, yeah. And this one I think took me it took me a little bit to like cuz it's a lot. There's a lot of details in these songs, but one of the reasons that I think this is kind of the record that people get into or this is a lot of people's favorite record is because honestly like some of their most accessible and conventional songs are on here as well. I mean, you have stuff like Heaven Alive, which is a terrific single, and we'll get to that. Music for a Nurse, definitely we'll get to that one. And then other songs like New Pin, which is a personal favorite of mine. But yeah, it's just, it's a record that I've spent a lot of time with listening to each song. And I've kind of realized like only, it was actually only fairly recently that I realized this is flawless. Like I don't really find any faults here at all. There's a couple tracks that, I don't think are quite as strong as the majority of songs here, but they're still incredibly strong tunes. It's a great starting point for anyone trying to get into this band. 100%. Like I said, there's a refinement that some of the shaggier edges or some of the more indulgent parts of Efloresce are are carved out. And while there are moments on this record that, that exists more in a pure structural sense they feel less like that's the purpose than the interludes on eflores do there's just more integration into the flow of the record and again you have to reconcile that with what i was saying before which is how intensely emotionally fraught this album is like it is really pissed off and it is really kind of just kind of risking collapsing under its own weight at many different points as well there's more boldness in a lot of the musical decisions that are made here as well and that's reflected in the fact that the band themselves have a kind of complicated relationship with it as well uh a lot of them there was this idea and i you know haven't there's this thread that a lot of them were quite dissatisfied with this album when it initially came out and they kind of regretted a lot of the decisions that they made on it, particularly moments where they feel they kind of capitulated to make something a little bit more accessible. Uh, but then still Mike Venner considered, uh, considers that his favorite uh, ocean size album. So there's a, you know, obviously there's a complicated relationship between the members of this band and this album. And that's kind of quite normal. I think for a second record as well, where you're buoyed by the success of your first to kind of try more bold things. And this certainly is the boldest Ocean Size album. I remember hearing it for the first time, you know, and this was the second Ocean Size album I heard. And it was, I didn't get around into it until after Frames finally completely clicked for me. And I was like, okay, I'm energized. I need more of this band. I'm ready. I put this on and I just remember being totally overwhelmed in the best way possible by the entire experience, particularly Charm Offensive, the opening track here, right, which Mm -hmm. opens with this very sort of steady and kind of unassuming, you know, you've got this kind of slightly off-kilter drum pattern and the great interplay with the guitars as well that are coming through in it too. And Venner kind of sort of, again, because a lot of what he does on this album and particularly on songs like this is he's kind of trying to embody this perspective of someone who is manipulative or who represents a kind of manipulative force. Again, a lot of very anti Blair commentary here, but he, so he does this kind of like sort of strangely seductive and, but also kind of creepy affectation to his vocal tone as well, that he'll then contrast with this kind of more rough around the edges, kind of snarling quality as if this kind of, you know, uh, creature who's trying to seduce suddenly decides to kind of drop the act and and reveal his monstrous form right and again a lot of rock bands around the time perfect circle were doing this sort of thing too much much more tastelessly than ocean size were Mm. but yeah i i love that the the song just oozes charisma as well and then with that when that kind of like core riff comes in i love how kind of broken it sounds it's almost like it's just like trying to be a riff and kind of just sort of uh not being able to do it it's just this kind of like chugging into nothing like into a brick wall this this quality that it has i just love that and of course as well because Mm -hmm. the band play around with unusual time signatures too you get a lot of syncopation in uh the way that these musical ideas present themselves too so they'll cut off a little bit earlier than you're expecting them to and then cycle back in again and it just it really gets me going man it gets me kind of completely mm. psyched i love when an arrangement like this can just throw you off and just completely 
leave you wrong footed, right? It's not going to work for everyone. It's going to make it feel a little bit unsatisfying, maybe if you're not into that. But man, it's good, especially when that dun, 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 riff kind of just explodes mm-hmm. and you get the the this radiant kind of colorful landscape of sound that comes out of it as well such an incredible song then its vocal performance really opens up in these sections as well you get this again you can feel the, the seething rage coming through in his performance even his as he is embodying the the people or the institutions that he's mocking one of my absolute favorite moments in any ocean size moment man, is when he gets he's kind of the, you feel it rising as the song goes on and he's singing about you know how they've sold us out and thrown us in the fire they say we're the same but we're not mm-hmm. liars and then that kind of that riff that just sounded like it was broken early in the song comes in and you get a resolution to it and it's just the fuck it's the most fucking cool shit ever man it's just fucking <laughs> shit oh just completely God gets me going man i'm just fucking completely energized listening to this shit i can all my critical faculties go out the window when that riff comes in and gets completed at the end of this song and you just get it's like it, what a way to open the album man you're just fucking pushing the yeah. door down and just completely kicking the listener's fucking ass right and and i love that <laughs> they, they don't do that they they don't really do that anywhere else on any of their other albums mm. with the same kind of venom that they do here. It's just, Oh man, I love that. Yeah. Pretty much all of what you said. I, I just echo that sentiment. I would say out of the four albums, this is my favorite opener uh, that they have. And yeah. Same. Like for sure. Like I have to, I have to think about it for a second. Cause I'm like, um, would I, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I think this is their best opening track. And, like you said, the way it's kind of off kilter. But an- another point that I'll I'll keep stressing is they're able to interweave all these different interesting parts and different signatures that progressive rock music, prog metal, whatever is known for. But they also are just masters of building, building, and building until the final moment where it just goes to that bow oh, dead oh no. Oh, well they're great it's at like having a composition that's building tension and building up to something without you being constantly aware that that's what they're doing because they have so many different sections yeah. and so many different parts you you know different musical ideas yeah. for the verses to the chorus and the song is always kind of you know the, it's like the, one of my favorite things about ocean size it feels like everyone in this band is so creative that they constantly have a new idea that they think of that they can bring to the table and the best ocean size compositions find a way to do that to keep kind of reinventing and evolving with these new ideas that each member is bringing to the table without any of it feeling disjointed or like it doesn't cohere in a meaningful way and what's so cool about charm offensive is that even though it's maybe the most self-contained ocean size opening track it's still because of how locked in they are to how important album construction is it still is basically just a lead-in for heaven alive which again yeah. it's one of those like one of those examples of this is one of the band's greatest songs and they don't really have any other songs that sound like it kind of category mm-hmm. like they, they they do but they don't really have any other songs that are quite as just I don't even know how to describe Heaven Alive. It's just like that, that kind of grooving, uh, but sort of distorted and chunky baseline kind of weirdly reminds me of like, I don't know, James Bond or some kind of like spy movie theme or this uh, Mission Impossible (laughs) sort of vibe. And the song just completely letting you kind of be embedded in that is and not know where it's going to go as well. The guitar kind of double track tracking that bass part as well is so just fantastic this this incredible sense of momentum that's building off of charm offensive so beautifully panning is used here more subtly than on it was on FLRS, but still super effectively uh if you are listening to headphones as well you'll really feel that effect in fact one of the things i will say while this isn't my favorite uh production style on any of their records and part of that is that if you're just listening through it with um, AirPods or, you know, if you're not listening to it with full headphones or with a full sound system, a lot of it can kind of sound not dry, but it kind of can just sound a little bit overwhelming if you don't have the right system for it. But Mm -hmm. still 
it's there's so much happening like you have that midsection with these sort of airy overlaid vocals and just a real focus on the groove as well i love how heavily they lean into grooves on this album it is like so satisfying and obviously ties so much back to you know the different forms of metal that they borrow from from the 90s as well yeah similar to like amputee from flrs i feel like this is this is a song that could have easily made it to rock radio with that relatively steady groove, which that bass groove, it's so good. And it reminds me, actually, the song that immediately comes into mind is the National Anthem by Radiohead. Oh, yeah. It has that, it has totally. that like, I'm annoyed. I didn't think of that. Like, because I think yeah. there's a lot of Radiohead influence and Ocean Size. I've already mentioned oh, yeah. how uh whichever song i mentioned like how massive bereavement kind of feels like it, it borrows a lot from johnny greenwood and ed, ed o'brien specific uh respective uh playing styles um mm-hmm. so yeah i think you get a little bit of that here too john ellis definitely channeling a little bit of colin greenwood with that bass part so good yeah absolutely and just like the weird sound effects that they kind of add in from time to time like that here like it makes no sense like in isolation but with the song that there's just it just adds so much and it's a sort of maximalist rock song that where every single part just makes perfect sense within the song. Absolutely. And, and what like, a chorus. Oh God. <laughs> this release inside me. God. It, I, I, I've literally I, like been in the storeroom at my, at work and just like listening to this and just like, you know, take it, do a quick, you know, double take, make sure no one else is around and just completely rock out to that chorus. Man, it's good. It's so good. And, you know, you get a continuation of this theme of political control that's going to carry across most of the record as well. And here they integrate religion as a means of manipulation. A lot of rock bands were writing these kinds of songs in uh, the 2000s as well. But a core thing, again, another thing that separates Ocean Size is, you know, a lot of dour ass prog and metal and rock bands writing these songs about how about political control and the way that you know uh, governments use organized religion and all that kind of stuff to control the populace yada 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 very dour subject matter very kind of you know but this is a fucking fun song man you don't Mm -hmm. feel like you're you're being preached to or you're being kind of like you know given a lecture on totalitarianism or whatever you're just having a fucking fun time with this absolutely addictive song that is doing mm-hmm. so much musically to complement its theme as well. How hypnotic it is, how catchy it is, how that mirrors the idea of, you know, the way the, that governments will sell things like religion or will sell, you know, organized processes to keep people, you know, doing what they want them to do, essentially. Great alignment of music, lyrics, and everything you'd want. It's a perfect song. Well, absolutely one of my two yep. favorite Ocean Size songs, no doubt. Oh, yeah. I remember when Morgan posted this like in the chat it was like this is the greatest song i've heard in like recent memory or something like that yeah like, yeah it's like yes yeah it's it like it, ha- it had again, to happen again it certainly depends on your aptitude as a listener but this is certainly one of the first ocean size songs i'd recommend to someone who really just wants to get hooked because mm-hmm. this will do it man this is the Sorry. one that the new metal Twitter page posted well out of all fuck their songs. Yeah, <laughs> and that makes sense as well like this is Honestly, like yeah. perfect Again, our listeners who aren't super active on Twitter and don't know about this account will probably, this will be lost on them, but this is the most crazy moments in new metal history core ocean size song. Yeah, For sure, honestly. it just has that ballistic energy that isn't new metal, of course, but carries with it that sort of irreverent spirit uh, that feels very true to, you know, a lot of the fun that those bands were kind of championing in their music. And then you get Homage to a mm-hmm. Shame, which kicks in, Oh with my this God. fucking Dillager escape plan, math core esque riff, yes. completely flips the script, but at the same time continues this ferocious energy that the first two songs have established. I mean, again, I see this is the heaviest ocean size album. I stand by that, and you really get a sense of it from how these first three tracks just completely push forward with this sheer weight. This could, this is a contender for maybe the heaviest song that they've ever made. And it's easily one of my favorites that they've ever written. It's just an absolute blast start to finish. Even like the, like, like you said, I actually immediately thought Dillinger when I first heard the song, 
I was like, wow, like that beginning riff, up. Like, well, it just has like, and, and even like Venner, it sounds a little bit like Greg Pucciato and sort of Ironworks era, uh, Option Paralysis era uh, Dillinger, where he's just kind of really yeah. leaning into that character. And, um, you know, I, 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 again, coming into Ocean's Eyes, having already been a huge Porcupine Tree fan, having already been a huge Dillinger Escape Plan fan, hearing these sort of, I don't know whether it's an influence or whether it's just the fact that these are similar bands, you know, working at a similar time and probably drawing from similar places, but it just sets it up for me, for me to completely adore it. Homage to a Shame is absolutely one of the most like irresistibly ear guitarable ocean size songs. Like it's so hard to listen to this and not just be completely fucking, you know, rocking out the whole time and trying to like, you know, ear guitar to the different parts. Cause again, there's so many great riffs in this, but there's also a lot of great layering and the more open sections of the song as well. There is this, one of my favorite details on the entire album is this really long held distorted note, exactly two minutes into the song that just is this amazing detail that really gets you inside inside of how completely fucked the mind state of this music is. You know, Venner is so good at getting you just completely discombobulated. And that is the aspect, again, it reminds you most of some of the more extroverted and extreme um, prog music of the 2000s. And and also the hardcore music that came out of as well. There's a little bit of at the drive-in in here and in, 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 in flashes as well. I just... Yeah who it's irresistible man it's so yeah. good it's so dramatic okay. as well it's a fucking melodramatic yeah. song yeah i especially again just picking and choosing different like guitar leads and guitar parts part like where it's more chilled out and then that like that like really high lead that cause it's like it's i'm like that like floors me every time and also like it's songs like this, even though as much as I love Venart's singing style, it's songs like this that makes me wish he screamed more in songs because he just has like the most f- like frantic scream. Like it's so high pitch and just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I yeah. don't even know how to do it. But you but you just, appreciate like, as well with how, how much he restrains that, how hard and how much it makes those moments where he does scream that's, feel that's so much true, yeah. more. Like, and I also want to shout out as well, this is a song that's completely all consuming in its musical intensity, and yet it has some of Venet's most like beautifully crafted lyrics. Like even the chorus mm-hmm. itself looks invent a felling in a meaningless exchange. It's a testament to perseverance and homage to a shame. And that's a beautiful passage. And again, there's so much about the theme of communication and the theme of miscommunication specifically, and willfully ignoring a problem as well and creating distractions to minimize that problem it's something that carries across the album so much and again the anger in venert's delivery here the sheer raw aggression is given so much extra weight by how well crafted his lyrics are and even at moments where he's just kind of like losing it and screaming cover your mouth and hold it or why can't i just tell the truth or you know that (laughs) kind of shit he just i i love that i love that so much yeah. And so that is the opening stretch of the album. That is the ferocious beginning of the record. And then you get one of my favorite ocean sized deep cuts, like a song that is bound to be overlooked just because of what it's surrounded by, but it's so much beautiful musical intricacy that I adore it, which is the song Meredith, which is actually featured on the OC, crazily enough. Uh, it's it's really? crazy to think that Ocean Size would be a band, you know, that would be in that kind of Death Cab for Cutie Core OC soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, thing but meredith was on that show apparently the oc soundtrack that that hit different like they were just choosing like the best music of the 2000s at, the, at that time like 100 yeah. percent. then these the, again this is a moment the album needs as well because you've been so fucking hammered by the first three songs you have these gorgeous mm. open mournful guitar tones here reminding me a little bit of some of those moments in the final stretch of efflores but with this intense foreboding bass bedrock that completely adds a new character to the emotion of the song. The vocals are eerie. They remind me of How to the Thief era Tom York. Just that slimy, you know, thing that Tom York would do when he was kind of trying to get into the character of, of someone manipulative. And that theme of manipulation is expanded here as well. Uh, but also between this and Homage, the central figure's actions uh you know ostensibly being this person in this position of power who's abusing it seems to be kind of tearing them apart inside and you get a sense of a fight to suppress their conscience 
coming through thematically as well, which adds this level of drama to the way the album is progressing too. Uh, the mix yeah. and the arrangement is just gorgeous during the chorus here. And you have those distorted electronics that were in parts of Efflores also adding flavor here too. Immaculate song. I, I, I absolutely mm -hmm. think that this is a track that deserves more love. This would on any like other album or any other like post rock album, especially this would be a major highlight because this is one of the more post rock songs on the album. I'd, I'd say it, it does have kind of that mysterious psychedelic sound to it. I especially love when at the very end where he's repeating that phrase, Oh, how I'd cut you to the bone. And then, and then like you just hear all this, just this building atmosphere and there's oh i cut you to the it stops and he says bone yeah and, that, that and shit like, literally Whoa. i get goosebumps at that moment incredible and then i just have in my notes here track five music for a nurse no notes needed connor why don't you take the lead <laughs> on this song because this is a special oh, song God. i know to, to both of us but i know that mm -hmm. it means a lot to you as well yeah i mean i don't really have like a personal story regarding like my history with this song but this is from what i remember i believe this is the most popular ocean size song and it's been featured on like even like, like shows and commercials but like out of all their songs this is the one that you may possibly have heard and this is like one of the saddest songs i've ever heard in my life um but not necessarily in a bad way not like it's so incredibly depressing that it's borderline unlistenable. I, I, I return to the song a lot just because I find it's, it's probably the most straight up cigarose that they've ever sounded. And it just beginning just with those super clean echo laden guitars that just, they just ring out, just let those ping pong delays just bounce around your head for the beginning and then the drums come in with the shuffling soft beat. Like this is this is everything that the first three tracks weren't. Because again, you had such an incredibly loud, intense introduction to the album. Then you get kind of the mysterious psychedelic atmosphere of Meredith. And then you get this song, which is just one of the again, one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life. Like the and I'm sure. Riley, you'll talk about some of the lyrics on here, which is, I think this is lyrically my lyrically my favorite Ocean Size song. There's one line in particular that like brushes me every time, which is the, if I display just a fraction of the soul you showed in this world, then I know I'll see you again. And I'm like, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting song to think about it's... in the context of this album as well. So much of which has embodied this perspective of someone who has power and manipulates it, alternating with the perspective of someone who is, you know, increasingly losing their tolerance and increasingly angry with the system that they're interwoven into. And so this song almost feels like it's kind of just comes out of nowhere and maybe has very yeah. little tangible connection to that. I guess if I was to going to try and um, force a continuation, I would say that based on the more sort of reflective and guilty tone of Meredith, it's almost like a moment where this central character is kind of rediscovering and realizing the humanity that they've suppressed and maybe the, the side of themselves that died when this particular person that means a lot to them died or left them or, or exited their life in some way. So it's this kind of central moment of reflection that again is so blindsiding, not even just for Ocean Size, but just in the context of this album as well, which has so much negative energy, uh, just imbuing it in every second up until this song. And then when those opening echoed um, guitar tones come in, it's almost like all of that has evaporated and you're just kind of this guilt or this negative emotion that's consumed the album and consumed Venet and his perspective up until this point is just kind of melted. And you're seeing the kind of molten core underneath that hard shell. And, you know, I think if it's not a very representative ocean size song, again, like heaven alive, it's one of mm -hmm. these songs that kind of just sort of stands as quite distinct from most of the other music they've made. I and mean, you can hear shades of the kind of similar ways they evoke this beauty on songs like, you know, women who love men or whatever, but still it's this, it's its own thing entirely. Um, and 
how to just describe there's no way of describing the lyrics on this that would be more meaningful concise or effective than simply reading them i mean you, the line yeah. you recited is is just utterly breathtaking as well i'm always also taken with uh, love so much to give and too few to share it with wastes you away and it's kind of telling and sort of insightful as to how maybe that the the characters that are perspectives in the song reached the point that they did by having this overwhelming feeling inside that they couldn't resolve or that they couldn't connect with someone else and so it's kind of curdled into this you know ugliness that has wasted this person away essentially and there's that you know the the final part of the song as well you know i pull you close and hold you tight and into the sky you go i mean any song that does that goodbye sky harbor thing of like evoking the uh, the the separation by ascent into the clouds uh you know i'm always going to be a sucker for that right it's always going to completely undo me and just make me a crying puddle of, of you know just a complete mess mm. and you know the song the way the song rises musically along with it as well it's a, you know it's a fairly traditional song um musically and structurally compared to some of the other stuff ocean size do but given that this is a band that you have such multifaceted and, and shifting and complicated progressions it actually feels like a much needed change of pace to have a song that is so musically simple as well. Just very straightforward chord yeah. structure, very straightforward post-rock build and very p simple, but effective climax that it reaches as well. And it really does feel like, you know, it's funny, like the reference point, and then this maybe might seem a little bit rote, but the reference point I thought of a lot was like the ending of E.T., <laughs> For some reason, just like, <laughs> you know, this loss of innocence moment where you're just kind of watching this, you know, this figure or this, this symbol of your coming of age essentially just float off into the sky and leave you behind. I'm sure there's a better analog than E.T., but for whatever reason, that's just what I've been thinking of this week. A necessary but a painful goodbye um, and, and lingering on that line of I can't change it as well really emphasizes that in, in this brutal but so profound way frankly when i said earlier that this band has <clears throat> made me cry on multiple occasions this is the primary culprit out of all their songs it's just like it's just so hard to not just feel every single word and even just the guitar and like that sin i think it's like a simply like just that stuff like that's probably some of, to me. that's probably like, some of Gambler's key work happening in there. He's yeah. always adding details like that to these songs. I haven't mentioned him specifically very much, but he's mm -hmm. totally like, you know, the Ed O'Brien of this band who's always doing yeah. interesting textural stuff, as well as being part of the, you know, the guitar dream team, but just doing so much of the more sort of effects related stuff that adds so much character to these songs. Exactly. And the whole like last sec section of the song. Like you said, with you those lyrics, I pull you close and hold you tight into the sky you go. Like the way that, like it's not even just listening to it. You can't even really make out what Venard is saying because it's just so laden with effects and massive guitar layers. But it sounds like he's just seeing. Like it sounds like he's actually ascending into the sky, and it's just like it's just one of the most powerful moments in any song ever written, and. Mm at a loss for words it's just the song is just what's there to say like just go listen to the song at least yeah and again it evaporates beautifully and gives you it leads beautifully into new pin as well which introduces mm. some really nice kind of swing elements and the rhythm section that feel very novel for ocean size and especially for the album at this point as well it feels like you know, you get a real sense, okay, the album is fully opened up by this point. And we've kind of shed a lot of the claustrophobia of the opening stretch for something that's more familiar ocean size wise, but there's so much dense and intricate layering happening in this song. New Pin is like a personal favorite. Uh, I used to kind of pass the song off as like being the song that follows up the greatest song of, of all time. <laughs> um <laughs> But like as I've listened to this more, I've realized that like, like the for example, the distorted like electronic drums that fade out of 
music for a nurse and into this song that started off and then coming in with the real drums and the that like deep like somber clean guitar um and this is again i've i've said this about multiple songs but this is seriously one of my absolute favorite choruses that they've ever written they've ever it's written really it's just like yeah it's very yeah. it's, it's such gorgeous. a it's such an amazing melody and the way like the drums are playing it was long it's just it's just like i feel like i'm flying through portals of different dimensions the way that this chorus just soars and the way that venart writes this vocal melody and and then i absolutely love the outro too where it gets more distorted and, like, and it's almost a techno weird. thing like, going on there yeah, it's like, like just a it's an, i like don't like this phrase but idm moment <laughs> Yeah, well, it's sort of a little bit like, um, you know, again, bands like Dillinger as well would occasionally do that, would allow, would would have this yeah. weird pivot, and, and Deftones do that as well, and they're self-titled at moments as well. It's just a nice touch as well. It feels like you have these recurrent threads of electronic influence coming through in parts of the songs, and sometimes they will, will actually take center stage to a service structural purpose. And then you've mm. got No Tomorrow, which is one of my favorite songs on the back half. Lovely yes. rhythmic work in this song. One of my favorite John Ellis bass parts in this track. There are the scream, <laughs> the scream, and the, and the way that it functions as a dynamic shift into the chorus is amazing. I just completely caves my head in as well. This is the moment where you're like, okay, we're back into the territory of the first three songs. Yep. We've had this excursion away from that and we've come back as well. Like there's a great, you know, there's a sense of um, structuring ebb and flow across their albums and you really get a sense of how it comes through here as well. It's The song's kind of a little bit similar to Heaven Alive, but it's less claustrophobic. Um, it's got one of the more outwardly angry and chastising uh, lyrical passages as well. There's this particular potency of and venom. And I can't help when I'm reading the lyrics of this song and listening to it, thinking how well it kind of applies to the current political situation with regards to how non-responsive a lot of governments are to the climate crisis as well. Like there's this sense of uh, you know, Venner is really going off here. Like, is faith yeah. against your faith that carves a look of love into your face as if you are proud of this disgrace? Accelerate and charging through the days. You try not to listen anyway. Reputation's not an alibi. What do you see when you close your eyes? Like royalty or magic numbers or popular opinion just to prove that you are right. A sugar spoon feed and withdrawal and still needing for more. The lights that guide you will burn and blind you. What cannot speak cannot lie. I beg for more patience, but you're still wasting. I should not have to make apologies. Find a face, put it on, pretend there's no tomorrow. I, I love yeah. that the just the sheer aggression here. It, again, mm -hmm. it adds to this feeling of catharsis. And this is one of the most cathartic um ocean size albums as well. It's the anger is pointed and it and it's taken to a point where you can really just commiserate but also feel your own frustrations come through and and have a, a kind of channel for them through the music uh, i i love when yeah. when venet really leans into that it's not subtle it's kind of you mm. know overbearing in certain ways as well but it serves a good purpose and it fits for what the album is yeah and oftentimes like bands in the prog vein when they get political it can be really eye rolling i mean i know I know Jake had a really tough time with that new Riverside album. Uh, <laughs> not to th not to throw any shade because I know that that band's supposed to be really good. I just haven't heard their older stuff. But anyway, like this is a perfect example of I think like the whole angry, po politically, socially motivated lyrics. L like that the whole excerpt that you read, I just think is it it's it's really brilliant. And again, Venner is such a good writer. That, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that. Um, I especially, I think one of my favorite, if not my favorite moment on this song is the very end where they just say, fuck it. And just go on, go full on metalcore breakdown mode where it's just like these, dun, 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 dun. it sounds like poison the well or something like just some, it, it sounds like some old school, like metalcore breakdown shit that I'm just like, Jesus Christ, they are angry. <laughs> Yeah.
and like going into mine host as well like there's this interesting like shift in perspective as well there's almost like it's hard to tell whether it's directed at the same person or whether it's like a different perspective uh in this kind of antagonistic relationship but there's this almost like reaching out and trying to um convey sympathy coming through in the song it's obviously one of the most instrumentally restrained moments on the album it's also uh supposedly the first part in a trilogy uh, of songs that closes the record out although the the connective mm. thread there is less apparent to me than it is on say FLRS, but apparently that's intended and um it sets up you can't keep a bad man down really really well because yeah this is not one of my favorite songs on the record i'll be honest in fact it's probably you know more towards the lower end of my ranking but i do really really appreciate again like no tomorrow and like um homage to a shame as well like what a consistent howl of rage it is at systems like this is one of the least dynamic ocean size songs in general like so much of this is just like a consistent like almost like you know Devin Townsend-esque like sustained loudness in a single mode as well and that can be a bit much sometimes I tend to like Ocean Size more when they can break that up a bit and they don't really do that mm. they do it a little bit in the midsection of the song but so much of this song is just this continuous heft in this one mode and I give it a pass because it fits thematically and it feels like it's this kind of choke point essentially for the rising uh, tension in terms of the aggression at the heart of the album but it's a very overwhelming song to listen to yeah when i made a you know like a month or two ago my top 25 ocean size songs i put this like i think at like number 24 or something and i was re-listening to it just like the other day thinking like I feel like maybe this is one that I could take off and replace with something else that I might have left off. But what what happened was I actually bumped this one up because I was like, geez, like, again, no one else is writing songs like this. Like, it does have that really, like, consistent loudness, maximal heft to it. And then when it gets into that midpoint where you just get these flurries of guitar and like vocals it kind of reminds me of the opening to a song like in a sweater poorly knit by me without you (laughs) right (laughs) which which if you if you've heard that song it has these it starts off with these flurries of guitar and but with this song like when they do the same thing but louder it's one of the most overwhelming moments in any song ever and the way the way Venar is singing over it, just holding out these notes for as loud and as long as he can. It's just, mm. it's one of my favorite moments in their whole discography. I just, incredible penultimate track. Yeah, it's one of the least subtle uh, ocean size songs yeah. in every respect. Like by the end of it, again, the whole point, the points and the, the aggression and the fury that Venner has risen throughout the album basically just climaxes in him saying, all you fucking pigs have crucified us. And then, you know, kind of throwing that up against the recurring lyric of the song, which is like so hilariously understated in comparison to that, which is just, don't you think it's time that you stopped? And you know, <laughs> it's really cutting and, and effective. And again, you need to like with um saturday morning breakfast show it feels like this is kind of like the 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 real sort of you think when you're listening to it like this is the kind of like high point climax of the album and then they pull out the stops for ornament the last rungs you know first Mm. three minutes of this are obviously a much needed sort of reprieve from that intense weight of bad man but boy when this song gets going like I love the way, first of all, that it's it starts with a reprieve, but it establishes the core musical ideas of the song one by one. You know, it's not just a reprieve, it's setting up how the song is going to go, essentially. And then how the big shift in the song for its last few minutes is essentially just like a an adaptation of the ideas that are introduced in the first half. Brought together, of course, by an explosion of sound. You have this gentle, jazzy interlude with some softer keys. And then that final section with just 
this amazing melodic part again it's the the core ideas and, and of this melody are introduced early on but again like with charm offensive it's not given a full resolution until this final section and it's so satisfying you know with those multi-tracked harmonized vocals it, mm -hmm. it really gets to me man it's this amazing cathartic expression that feels like the album would be completely incomplete without it and yet it blindsides me every time i listen to it What's funny is this this song actually took me a little bit to get into, um, which is kind of weird because this is this is when I've tried and looked up people's favorite uh, or fans fan favorite Ocean Size songs. This is in like every top ten that I've seen. Like people are like ornament the last. Some people are like this is the greatest song that they've ever made, and I think like the layered vocals I first thought were a little cheesy, but now I'm like this it deserves it because this song this is such an overwhelming closer i love the again with the effects that they use on the guitars like the 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 wavy tremolo sound on the opening clean guitar which that clean guitar riff is just i love like a a memorable but simple clean guitar riff like the this one and of course the beginning of music for a nurse they, they just they're masters of that and when they go into that final moment and the way that they just kind of repeat the same vocal melody throughout the whole song and well, actually before that another one of my favorite moments is they're building up this whole clean moment but then when the when it just all of the sudden comes in with those down, 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 down hits it's like it's it, it's a perfect jump scare to mm. put it to to put it in kind of a weird way but yeah that whole like ending section where multiple vocalists are just screaming out the lyrics it's just like that you could not have dreamed of ending this album in a better way i think this was just like a perfect way of concluding an album that's so like you know internally fraught like and what i mean by that is you know the whole yeah. album occupies these very individualized perspectives of characters or people who are so consumed by whether it's power or whether it's by their hatred and distrust of power or whatever it is to end the album in such a way that emphasizes this communal aspect of strength like the vocals all being this you know chorus of of multiple people as well and it feels like this moment of, of ascension where and connection as well that the whole record holds off on until this moment as well. And it gives a new meaning to the title of the album as well, which kind of you can read up until this point as kind of being a bit of a cynical title that reads about how people are will always be afraid to step out of line and stand up to oppression, essentially. Whereas here it's given this new meaning, which is everyone actually, you know, stepping into position into their place to uh you know actually do something meaningful and do something that their whole life has essentially built them up towards and it's just so beautiful and amazing and like an incredible finale to an album that you know absolutely needs to really sell the final hit in order to land and it completely does once again, another two-year break between albums, and we come back again, same sort of time of year. At 1st of October 2007, we have the third Ocean Size album, and I think debatably, this band's masterpiece, in as much as one single album can be the pinnacle, Frames. This is a really special record. It was the first Ocean Size album mm -hmm. I heard, uh, primarily because it was in connor's coveted list of 10 out of 10 perfect albums uh, a list which i basically invariably turn to whenever i need to get my shit rocked without you know any doubt that it will do that and you know funnily enough the first time i heard this i liked it a lot and there were particular moments that stood out to me but i don't think i was fully prepared for the nuanced approach to prog rock and songwriting that this album actually presents i think i was a little thrown by it and it wasn't quite what I was expecting. There was a lot about it I loved, and there was a lot about it I connected to, but I could tell pretty quickly that this was a record that I would need to really spend some time with to just understand the intricacies of everything that it's doing. And I 
acclimatize myself to how unusual a lot of the songs were in terms of the melodic and chordal ideas that they present, the places that they go with those ideas, and genuinely how uncompromisingly original of a vision this is in the world of prog rock. Um, and now even with the context of their two previous albums, I understand it better, but I still almost have even more of a sense of what an achievement and what a distinct entity Frames is than I did before. It absolutely feels like something that the band have been moving towards. It certainly is a refinement of so many of the strengths of their previous records, but it is a refinement in more senses than just one. It is an absolute culling of excess. I mean, if we talk about everyone in position as being this completely ragged, rough around the edges, aggressive, throw everything at the wall and completely commit as hard as possible to make that feeling come through, Frames is... The total inverse of that it is this let's cull everything that's unnecessary build these songs from the ground up really emphasize layering not only as an aspect of how we compose but as the core fundamental way of understanding these songs in general it is all about the layers every single song mm -hmm. here is about we start with a baseline layer in many cases we start with multiple baseline layers that just start at the same time we pile things on we take things away we introduce counterpoint we see what happens we take a core melodic or harmonic or chordal idea and we push it into a new place and we explore what it could be and how it could evolve in a way that feels kind of akin to jazz in certain respects as well there's this fundamental adherence to kind of exploring progressive music as an idea and progressive compositions in a way that are much less tied to the conventions of prog rock to the conventions of post rock all that kind of stuff and are much more free form and willing to incorporate more far-reaching influences as well as a result frames feels like a completely different experience to any other ocean size record it also helps that we have chris sheldon back behind the boards on this one as well and just taking the essence of every element of each member of this band and refining it to perfection. I like, I love every Ocean Size album. I think they all sound great, but by far and away, this is the best sounding Ocean Size record and one of the best yep. sounding albums I've ever heard from an engineering standpoint. It is a masterclass. You know, it's Steely Dan Asia levels of like, absolute perfection and the way that every sound has been honed to sound completely crisp and perfect. Connor, I'd love to hear from you at this point on what your overall thoughts on this album are, especially coming off the back of those two previous albums we've talked about that are so, you know, much more sort of maximalist than what this is. How do you feel this album sort of is different from those previous records and what do you love so much about it? With their debut, F. Flores, it's that album, as we said, is very like spacey, psychedelic, and very heavy at points, um, with uh, various interludes as well. And it's very long, very proggy. And then you get uh, everyone to position, which is a little bit more conventional structurally because every song, uh, for the most part, is like its own song and its own distinct sound. Frames is in many ways kind of like the culmination of both of those because each song has a very has their own very distinctive qualities that separate it. You're not going if you listen to this album, you're not going to get the same thing, the same idea with any moment on any individual track. Every single track is like its own beast, really. There is not a short song on this album. Everything is. I don't even know like what the shortest song is. I think it it's Sleeping Dogs. Uh, no, it's Unfamiliar, but barely. Yeah, unfa Unfamiliar by with but six even, and a half minutes. Even that already kind of feels like a, an extension of commemorative nine eleven T shirt as well, because of the way those two songs yeah. just run into each other. There's a great sense of momentum with this album as well. It almost feels like, especially for the first half as well, because the first half of this album has this kind of like real just locked in flow to it, where each track kind of almost feels like it's just continuing from the last, even as it introduces new ideas. You almost get a sense that the, the album is being performed for you live 
basically for the first yeah. half of this record. And even when I listen to the album in live format, like you barely notice a difference when the band are playing these songs live because there is just such this sense to which each song builds to a moment and to a place that the next song can then launch off of or come down from, however it makes the most sense at that point in time. And I'm just completely engaged and locked in immediately when commemorative 9-11 t-shirt, amazing title, by the way, which comes mm-hmm. from a story where uh, the front man of the Cardiacs, Tim Smith, sold Mike Bennett a t-shirt that was um, that came in sizes 9 to 11 or something like that. And he called it a 9-11 t-shirt. There's a weird thing. I don't want to get into it. It's just a funny anecdote. But anyway, this song comes in with its absolutely hypnotic piano part as well and we've had piano in previous ocean size songs but never is the lead so immediately that's a great way of the arm to kind of introducing it to itself and separating from anything you've heard from this band before it is just this again it it showcases the influence of different forms of progressive music as well like more european forms of progressive music from the 70s too coming through and of course you have you know mark huron's incredible drumming just providing an an anchor as well as soon as he comes in too. And again, his drumming is flashier and and jazzier, but also more sort of fitting to these arrangements than it ever has been before. It's astonishing how creative he is. And each drum part he lays down is unconventional in some way on this album. And commemorative 9-11 t-shirt, you know, functionally, it is one of the least sort of distinct songs on the album, I suppose, because it does kind of just feel like this gradually ascending introduction, but it has so much of its own identity because of that piano part and because of that just massive build that it gives you when it completely explodes towards the end that, you know, you could not have the album begin in any other way. And then, Mm. dude, Unfamiliar is incredible. Unfamiliar is (laughs) I mean, that guitar lead, that is going to forever be in my brain. Like, it is just one of my favorite Mm. guitar leads on any song ever. Uh, Astonishing. Even the chords that they play underneath it just have so much heft, so much weight. You just feel the power, and they sound so massive. And then even, like, when they change it up, change up, like, the riffs and stuff, and go, like, like... And then the bass too, like like again, it's like I sound like I'm just talking about like all the noodling that they're doing, but the you just have to hear the way they're locked in on just the intro of the song. And that's not even going into the rest of the song, which is just yeah, this is one of my favorite songs of all time for reason. It's just such an incredible tune absurd groove construction on those verse parts as well and the way that those grooves just again open up into that chorus vocal part into that main line and again venert's vocals he's always been a great vocalist and a great writer but it feels like he finds this newfound confidence here you know and he's obviously confident Mm -hmm. everywhere into position but it's a kind of brash you know, rambunctious, aggressive confidence. Whereas here he feels confident in a much more assured way. Like also to do with the way that he's mic'd and his vocals are mixed on this album as well. They're much more present. They're much more focal. And he just finds a level where he's able to, he has this buttery smooth quality a lot of the time that just feels so fitting for how, again, tasteful a lot of these arrangements are. I always think about him the way that he sings that they said silence is sometimes pays a lot like that just that part of the song when it completely yeah. opens up like that unreal to me just completely all encompassing and enveloping and so cathartic and again he finds yeah. these levels and he shifts in ways that feel so natural and never dramatic like it's just mm-hmm. This is the thing about frames is it might not land for you initially because there's not a lot of dramatic dynamic craziness on this album like there are on previous ocean size records there's very few of those massive tonal shifts or of these kind of very you know traditionally progressive moving sections and all that kind of stuff everything just kind of breathes in these songs and new sections will evolve very naturally and you might not even notice how the song's changing now i don't have a super you know, huge knowledge of music theory. I have some knowledge, 
but, but one of the cool things that I read about this album and then coming back to it, I was able to appreciate is that there's basically no four, four time anywhere on this album. There's no mm-hmm. traditional time structures anywhere on this album. There might be certain parts where they do a few bars of that. Like maybe in uh, Christie's, I, I think there might be a few bars. I'm not hundred percent sure, but for the most part, it is unconventional time signatures. And I don't say it to be like, oh, well, look how cool it is. They're using crazy time signatures. That makes the music objectively better. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is how these songs might not hit for you initially because they do a lot of things that are unconventional. They use a lot of syncopation. They use a lot of unconventional time signatures that end a musical idea one or two bars early. And that can kind of throw you. And it means that the... It, but it only makes it more impressive how organically they're able to evolve one idea into a new idea with you barely even noticing, right? It just mm-hmm. feels like, oh yeah, natural next step. Let's change this up. Let's add this different section. Let's make the guitar do something different. Let's completely up the melody and do something totally new. Let's add a second bridge or let's do a chorus and then never do that chorus the same way again. You know, let's add these new ideas. Let's, you know, from from Mark Heron's perspective, let's completely change up the rhythmic basis of the song. And the fact they're able to do that so naturally and so fluidly is stunningly incredible and is a testament to how, yeah. at this point, how completely locked into each other they are. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, there's a specific moment in the middle of Unfamiliar where... The guitars all just go into a clean sound, and they're all each of each of them are playing like single notes, but they're all playing it in different spots, and they're all panned differently. So you're getting like these like bursts of just like little clean guitar notes around your headphones, and it's just like it it's just master. You know, like not only is it masterful in composition, but also production, like making sure it sounds like all encompassing and in the way uh, unfamiliar ends with venard just like singing at the top of his lungs unfamiliar. and those guitars are just wailing like Again, such a satisfying like, conclusion to or like resolution of the main sort of guitar melody and taking it to a slightly new place that twists it but suits it to the climax of a song yeah it's it's ridiculous and then you, and then you got uh, trail well, of fire, man. Look, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think, and again, with my limit, admittedly limited, I did take music theory classes in high school for two years, so that's where some of my knowledge comes from. My admittedly limited knowledge of music theory and how, like, you know, music composition. I think that trail of fire is the most impressive and accomplished composition that Ocean Size ever made. Like, just mm, from a compositional yeah. standpoint. Again, there's a lot of that reminds me of like jazz fusion and the prominence of keys and certain guitar tones and and just the way that the song is arranged. But also just like the song has a lot of chord choices and chord progressions that are really unconventional. And that in combination with the slightly off time signature as well, it takes a lot of getting used to. But mm. this is such a beautiful piece of music. Again, especially like in that first section as well. Once the, the drums have come in as well and you have the the sort of sort of peepy sort of guitar part that's sort of like distant but beautifully melodic kind of bouncing up against the core foundation. The bass is so present and so playful and the drums are just kind of pushing each element forward. There's this amazing interplay that happens about one minute in and then happens again at the end of the song as well one of the most yeah. dizzying and beautiful passages of music I've ever heard in my life. And it is just a, a small part of where this song goes. I find this nothing less than breathtaking and spellbinding every time I listen to it. Again, some of the places it goes, some of the chord choices and some of the uses of dissonance and strange melodic ideas might throw you, but there's so much beauty in here. There's so much just rich prettiness in all of this. To me, again, even though they're largely considered a progressive rock band, I mean, genres are silly anyway, but in many ways, Trail of Fire is like the ultimate post-rock song. The way, like you were saying, the almost jazzy piano and guitar chords open it up and just kind of 
keep going throughout and then you add a little guitar lead that come that comes in at the very end that mm. like you're like you were saying how venar uh, often will like call back to a guitar melody with his voice and that's what he does at the very at the at the very end or like the whole second half of the song is on another plane of existence it's and then the way they call back to the very beginning at the very end of the song this is perfect structure then it has this like stunning melancholic tone to his vocal on this song that just i find so moving like he 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 brings and again I, I don't have a great handle on a lot of the lyrics on this album compared to some of their other records it's a little bit more obtuse trying to try and interpret a lot of what Venner is talking about there's some exceptions but um th- there's this sense of the of people who have been misused and abused and kind of tossed aside essentially and there's this just raw and unguarded compassion that comes through on this album so much this idea of being willing to sacrifice yourself or to let yourself essentially be swept away so that others can have it better so that something better can come in your wake the sense that your life maybe hasn't really added up to much or you haven't really done very much that you're proud of but you have this resolution to change that and to leave the world behind better in some small way from what you've done is this selflessness that comes through this willingness to abandon one's own pride and sense of legacy and just being willing to allow yourself to just be a part of history essentially or just to be a part of of paving the way for something better essentially and it's it's a theme that he explores in a lot of this album and this particular type of selflessness that he adopts this particular type of of wizened wisdom as well it feels particularly mature coming after the last few records too and i i I really adore it it just adds this additional vocal tone and emotional tone to the way he sings and what he writes that makes it feel very moving and there's just something about his vocal tone the way he sings on these songs that really just makes me like really like like, fuck i'm tired man i'm so fucking sad and tired and it's just like Mm -hmm. there's this feeling that he gets it and that he's not trying to put up any kind of front or be braver or smarter than he really is that he's just willing to accept whatever fate the world has for him essentially and try to do the best with that for whatever comes next and I love that. I love that at- mm-hmm. attribute. I think it's so, again, it's quite much, it's so mature and beautiful for a band like Ocean Size and for a writer like Mike Venner, who has so much kind of anxiety and, and, and pent up emotion coming through and, and, and a lot of negativity coming through on those previous records as well. A lot of it sort of melts away here. There's this willingness mm-hmm. to accept that, you know, while negativity can be useful when it's harnessed appropriately, a lot of the time, all it does is kind of send you spiraling, basically. And that kind of core lyrical idea of I'm not the picture, I'm the frame, which we'll get to in the last song, is the ultimate encapsulation of that, that ability to recognize that, you know, all of this sense that the world has betrayed you personally and kind of left you personally behind you know, you at some point you accept that you're not special and you're not unique in this respect. And that doesn't make what the world has done any less in, unjust, but it gives you a sense of perspective that this album adopts and really feels like, again, a, a mm. moment of synergy and, and of growing up that is, is really in tune with how musically sophisticated and musically refined the whole album is too. This opening stretch culminates in Savant, which Mm -hmm. is just one of the most emotional songs I think I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, It has this keyboard part from Gambler that it it opens up with, which is just so rich and warm and velvety, but also like previewing how deeply sad and melancholic the rest of the song is going to be. I, I don't actually know if I can really talk about this, to be honest. I'm saving so much emotional energy for the frame. And I don't know mm. if I can expend any additional energy on this song other than to say that it is the perfect 
you know, mid album climax type of song, right? It has this much mm-hmm. simpler structure than much of the record up until this point. And again, the drumming is always like way more sophisticated than it needs to be, but adds so much character. Venet's vocal performance is so melancholic, so longing, so sad. And it's like the whole band are kind of just coming around to kind of give him a big group hug basically with what the song is doing musically i just adore this track man this yeah this song is just unbelievably beautiful like it's hard to describe without actually listening to it all the different parts that they just like layer in at the beginning like you said starting with the beautiful pad keyboards going in and then the the clean guitar that comes in with the ride symbol, like I, that part right there, when that comes in, I'm just like, oh, we're in for something else. But like mm. an, another detail in terms of the production that I love is on a lot of these softer cuts, Venard's vocals are like going through some sort of filter that almost makes him sound like he's an astronaut, like just alone, like completely isolated from everyone else. And it just gives this, this very like spacious, but also melancholic and lonely, but also at times very peaceful sound that I just yeah. I'm absolutely obsessed with. Oh, and, that's a great detail. It's this kind of like yeah. mechanized distance and like an astronaut is a great way of like, of visually representing that. I think, yeah, it does mm-hmm. feel like, and again, like I've been saying a big theme of this record is kind of leading the realization that you individually and all your wants and desires and all that kind of stuff in the grand scheme of things don't matter. And that the peace that you're searching for through all of your frustration in the world will only really come to you once you accept that, essentially, and accept that the world is greater and bigger than you. And that's okay. It's okay not to yeah. personally matter that much. Uh, I love the the metaphor as well that he uses, the, the cast asleep, but the film remains. There's a lot of great metaphorical language used in the lyricism on this record that just evokes so clearly and beautifully the idea of, you know, existing and, and understanding your place and embracing and accepting the smallness that you, of your life, essentially, and of, and the, the endless the endless charade that will continue kind of long after you've gone and has started long before you started long before you were born. Uh, there's this great moment where he, you know, it's just this admission of pride as well. I place pride on tick and talk, which is a great and beautifully English way mm-hmm. of talking about how, you know, this living your life in this way where, where every second matters and you feel as, and if you feel as though you've wasted so much time, then you can spiral into depression and and the way he sings, it's lonely, silent until dawn. Like the way he sings that line is just so, just just dripping with melancholy. But mm-hmm. and then resolving it into saying, you know, it's a rite of passage, open doors. I'm not frightened. Like this admission that yes, I feel lonely, and yes, I feel scared, and yes, I don't like being in the dark. But I'm gonna power through that. I'm gonna accept that, and I'm going to realize that my fear doesn't matter and that i can choose to leave it behind uh where others float you and i crash land where i see us in far away skies i could not say where i am lost the darkness falls upon the day again it's all about the unknowability of the world and of the universe you don't have the answers you'll never have the answers and that's okay and there's something profoundly peaceful about the acceptance that this album instills in me. Like it, if I'm feeling particularly existentially anxious, this is a great album to put on because it's just calming in, in so many yeah. different ways. And so it's so stimulating too. Like mm. just everything that you're hearing on a song like this, like that, the like climax towards the middle where I don't remember exactly what he sings, but where he breaks out of that repetitive melody and he goes like, like the, like yeah, that part, like just, Oh God. Just and giving the, the cue for the, for the lead to just do that beautiful yeah. melody that it does with the drums coming crashing down and you get those like little, um kind of like tremolo arpeggios at the very end as well. Yeah. When it's all kind of cresting with the strings, man. Oh, it's, the it's... string climax is like, 
it's a cheat code at this point. Like when that's when those strings came in, when I first heard them, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, yeah. how, how'd you make this even better? Like, it's how? like, it's, it is like, like kind of a cheat code, like, right. It's kind of convention that a lot of, you know, bands will kind of just, oh, let's chuck an epic string part in there to make it really feel, you know, to make it feel like epic or whatever. But, you know, Ocean Size earn it because it's not something they do very often. So it feels as though it's this, you know, them indulging a certain stylistic and compositional you know, way of 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 creating a climax basically that feels earned because it's not a crutch that they, that they lean on very often. Um, exactly, and I yeah. like the way that the album kind of shifts gears in its second half as well. You go from these very sort of um, moody but forward moving, you know, kind of dreamy tracks into these sort of more kind of claustrophobic songs in the second half, like Only Twin, which I absolutely adore, even though so much mm-hmm. of it is really discordant and dour and minor key. And it kind of feels like in the first half of this song, you're kind of just tunneling downward into this darker and darker place as it goes on. But then it just like completely blows that up and ends with this, like, you know, again, the 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 chords and the tones and the notes are really sort of just suffused in the sick darkness and it's almost like a mocking climax at the end of this song but i i love what a complete upending of expectations that is and i also I'll always like how he delivers the lines in the verses that are almost like spoken and like you said just kind of with a, a bit more of a negative energy than the mm-hmm. than the rest of the songs like preceding it uh, old friend of the christies is, is like a fantastic interlude it's kind of like it's the most obvious piece of mogwai worship in their entire discography it's just basically a mogwai song and structure uh it, it's definitely stands out as an extended instrumental piece but I, I i just really enjoy this as an indulgence i love the the doomy mood of the early first half of it as well again those super mogwai s kind of um sort of dreamy sounding dun, 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 melodic parts that are just so just full of like portent and intensity and then the climax it builds to is fantastic as well yeah i have to ask what you think of sleeping dogs and dead lions as well because it feels like the one moment on this album where they kind of let themselves double back to the kind of bizarro like dramatic tonal shifts of their previous album as well and i think that that decision in combination with the increased focus and refinement of this whole album makes this actually one of their most satisfying heavier pieces in general like i've grown to yeah. really love this song me too yeah like i always found it a completely jarring choice to include it because it's like like i said every everyone into position and even flores i would say are considerably heavier almost more metal albums than frames but then you get this song which is maybe the heaviest song that and the heaviest and weirdest song that they've ever made Mm. like this was like before the early mid 2000 or mid 2010s um gent craze which not saying that this created gent because you know as we know mashuga existed long before this album did (laughs) but but like the fact that they just go like Mashuga on the song is just like, and then and then Venart's like singing in the verses too. Like it just it kind of makes my skin crawl, but in a good yeah. way. Like it's just it's so like ugly, and and then like the weird scat jazz fusion solo that fucking <laughs> like, love that section, man. That shit it's is like fucking crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's so is, good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, only this band could pull out, pull off Savant and then a moment like this that's like just, yeah. Like, what the hell am I listening to? Like, Look, it's av- avant garde metal shit. Like, I can completely understand if the sort of the whiplash inducing tonal shifts in this record, particularly in the second half, throw people off and kind of leave them feeling a little bit cold with it as a whole. But I, I love it. I, I love how Ocean Size take basically every aspect of their entire discography up up to this point and all the different attributes that have become so charismatically them and are just giving you doses of them and this more refined and agile form that is just so beautifully smooth in its execution even in the most bizarre moments as well like you get this 
you know, you get one of the great big dumb riff moments ever in this song. It's just this boom, 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 <laughs> boom, boom. That's so like, um, you know, charm offensive esque. And I love that. I love the way that's integrated into this song that has so many other disparate elements that it's amazing. It works so well. It's amazing. It works as well as it does, but I, I completely adore it. And yeah, you know, and, and these weird shifts and these bizarre different directions that the album takes, only kind of like it's like ocean size are making an album like they might never get to make an album again and they're exhausting all these different Mm -hmm. ideas and they're finally bringing things together in a way that feels like so novel and so exciting for them and just leaves you basically gasping for air when the frame hits and just again those gentle soft single guitar notes that open the song up before you get that amazing little melodic part (laughs) that is just like one of the best melodies that they've ever composed even if it's only like a Mm -hmm. melodic phrase it's not really even a full thing uh it's just gorgeous and this is my favorite ocean size song no bones about it this is Mm-hmm. I think this is an absolute masterpiece. It is the best possible way they could have ended this album. It is one of the most emotional songs I've ever listened to as well. I have wept to this song multiple times. It's one of my favorite songs of all time at this point as well, especially yeah. with how all over the shop and abstract and obtuse Venerit has gotten lyrically across this album. It is just this beautiful moment of clarity where, you know, th- some of those realizations and mature moments of development that were displayed in the first half kind of coalesce into this just masterful display of selflessness and this again and all the also the way it calls back to so many of the themes that venner has been talking about about you know family and fatherhood and the idea of a transmission of legacy that has been a source of so much anxiety to him on albums like if there's this kind of understanding that comes through here and the sense of, okay, I need to pass the torch now. I need to kind of, I, there's something that is bigger than me now. There's something that's more important than me now, which is, you know, a child essentially, which is something that represents what will come and be around long after I'm gone. And I need to accept that. And I need to celebrate that basically. And that's what this song does it is a celebration and it is a confirmation and it is confiding and and wrapping your arms around someone and not saying you know everything's going to be all right not saying that you know it saying you know everything could turn to shit for all i know but it's in your hands now and i believe in you basically is the message of the song um don't look to me and don't necessarily do everything i did because i made mistakes and my favorite line venet's ever written don't presume there's wisdom when all that i am is time now you know it's this idea of don't think that everything i did i did out of some great plan i made mistakes my whole life was one mistake after another to some extent Um, but let that lesson exist for you and let you know learn from that and 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 be better and be stronger. And it's this ultimate selflessness, this ultimate disregard of, you know, your own ego that makes it to me completely profound. Mm -hmm. This is a top 10 favorite song of all time for me, I would say like just the long intro too, like where they're just playing single guitar note. And like you said that, do, 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 do. And then the those warm, luscious piano chords that come in, and then that oh, that synth lead where it's like, like, like they're and they're all playing it at weird times. Like they don't sound locked in, but they don't have to. That's the thing with Ocean Size is that they are locked in, but they don't not in a conventional way. And it's, I just I love everything about this song, especially when they all fully come in for that chorus of, and you sing like. Time won't, I won't change, change a thing when, when I'm gone. gone. Yeah. Oh man. 
and the, the, the little strings as well that are just kind of under oh. underlying all of that and just kind of pushing it all forward too it's, it's more subtle than the string parts in uh savant but still kind of yeah. really emphasizing those emotions one of the most yeah. like just the, by the time you get to the climax of the song it's like it's not introducing really any new musical ideas which is certainly new for ocean size but it's like really mm-hmm. recognizing the greatness of the musical ideas that are there and just allowing them to kind of be taken to their full potential it's so beautiful on an album that is so much about evolution and change to kind of recognize when an idea or something that represents you know, a, a good place, you know, or, or something that is positive or something that the future should be built on can then just be emphasized and celebrated. You know, that fits yeah. so thematically with what the song is about lyrically too. I, I, I just, everything about this floors me. You know, it, it mm-hmm. did the first time I heard it and now I'm like more in love with it than I ever have been. And that, again, yeah, that idea, it's... that closing lyric, I am not the picture now, I am the frame. That That is... Like one of the most profound things I've ever heard in a song, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And the way, like, like that that line kind of echoes that opening guitar line that you were referencing, and mm-hmm. then and then just in the background, you could just hear him just just belting out, "I'm the frame." Like, mm. I I don't know how to describe it, but like, man. And then of course the climax at the end with mm. the guitars and strings. It's just like astonishing that line I, I, that line that final line has been in my head ever since i heard this song because it's not just something as simple as you know i don't matter and i'm i'm irrelevant now it is it's not that at all it's that i'm not the the focus of this world or this family or this person's life or whatever but i am still irretrievably a part of it i am a part of the fabric that holds it together and that mm-hmm. kind of goes you right goes right back to the first line of the song. I can hold you all together. You won't fall with the troops we assemble in the bomb we forge. Like that's just poetry. Um, it I really is. I don't really know how to how to un- unpack it any better than it just does as you hear yeah. it. It's so that's the frame. That's frames, <laughs> which was yeah. originally called the frames until uh, I think it was a I might have been again a member of Cardiacs or a member of some other band like misremember the name that they see the think, album was yeah i think yeah. i read somewhere i don't know if this is true but it was a member of future of the left that's right maybe. yeah 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 anyway that's frames an absolute yep, masterpiece one of, one of my favorite albums <laughs> of all time i'll never be able to fully do it justice but i can only hope that i've inspired enough people to either listen re-listen depending on whether you've heard it or not or just take it in with a fresh pair of ears because i think this is as good as music gets and, and they need to put it back on streaming. And they fucking do. I, I get that it's yeah. probably not out of their control to some extent, but so stupid. A label thing, I assume. Anyway, Ocean Size, we're far from done at this point, though. In 2009, you got the Home and Minor EP, which was really like a, f- a further extension of some of the musical ideas here into a more sort of slow core place. It's a very restrained EP. There's very little in the way of heft in this project. It is beautifully melancholic music i've listened to it a lot like late at night when i'm lying in bed as well i think the title track is one of the most beautiful songs they've ever done as well and the strand and uh getting where water cannot are both also just beautiful um wonderful uh songs very simple again there's not a lot of complexity to the home and minor ep which is probably why it slips by a lot of people but there's plenty of beauty in it and it's nice to hear them Mm -hmm. in a shorter format just be devoted to the simple aesthetic of beauty without dressing it up I wouldn't want that for a full album from them, but it's nice in that format. It is a nice EP. It's definitely not one of my favorite releases from them. There's a lot of actually a lot of jazzy elements, especially in the drumming and the chord progressions mm. that I find satisfying. Again, it doesn't quite have the structural progginess that their best material does, but it's worth a listen for sure. Mm. Um, a lot of really beautiful, like meditative guitar work that you could just put on in the background, just like chill out to so 100 it's definitely it's worth noting for sure and then we have in 2010 again all their albums came out in either september or october which is just interesting in (laughs) september of 2010 we have self-preserved while the bodies float up the oft overlooked fourth ocean size album that both connor and i are here to say now 
deserves a lot more love than it gets like this album yeah. should not be overlooked when you're taking in the body of work of ocean size i think maybe part of the reason why it is is because frames is such a full realization of all of ocean size's potential that it kind of feels like it should be the end of the story almost and it forms this kind of perfect sort of p- pinnacle of their arc but self-preserved has some of their best songs on it just straight up some of their yep. best songs on it i have seen a lot of critiques of the album structurally and i just want to say for the most part i don't buy it i think this album is beautifully structured there's this great sense mm. of ebb and flow again it's a lot of what they were doing on Flores as well where you have this kind of rise to this pinnacle of intensity and then you let the album kind of come down from that and explore some softer ideas that are very beautiful in their own right and let it rise up to that intensity again i think that maybe if any if there's any critique maybe the most vital material is kind of condensed towards the midsection of the album or at least like towards the uh not necessarily right at the beginning or right at the end although there's songs i love and and Mm -hmm. right at the beginning and right at the end as well so that's kind of a hard point to kind of make it's it's an album that i see these weird facile criticisms for that i just don't quite buy because the experience of listening to it to me is immensely satisfying we're short on time so we'll go through this one a little bit more briskly than the other albums mm-hmm. but i mean part cardiac such a strange uh opener for <laughs> them as well especially in how like doom metally it is like it's not really doom yeah. metal but it has this doomy quality to it like what do you think i personally love the love part cardiac it's like straight up a sludge metal song Mm. which is like that they they've never really had before um in many ways this is i keep saying well everyone to position is probably their heaviest overall release but there's like this album has some of their heaviest moments on it and i also will say i won't have as much to say on this album as i do the other three just because i haven't it's the one i've spent out of the main four the least amount of time with but I just I find it r- incredibly rewarding every time I listen to it in full because it's just, it's just very clear that they're you would think from like you know internet ratings not that they mean anything but like you would think that they would be like kind of running out of ideas and I will say I do have some minor criticisms of certain songs here mm-hmm. but it's very clear that they were with this last album they were not out of ideas because the first four songs like just straight like straight up are some of their most creative songs i think yeah i think the one thing to hold against this record maybe and i don't hold it because i don't feel like this is really enough of a basis for me to like it that much less it's the one that doesn't really like advance their sound in any meaningfully new way i suppose like it's kind of just ocean size Mm. playing the hits in a lot of ways there are things they do on this record which are new for them there are songs that sound different and i think they really master the art of the more withdrawn and meditative ballad like there's a couple of songs on here well specifically ransoms and pine which i just think are incredible beautifully melodic um and more down tempo songs that showcase how strong ocean size can be when they allow themselves to really just very from the pathway of the intricate heavy complex progressive metal but then again you still have songs like build us a rocket then you rocket building cunt and uh, <laughs> it's my tail i'll chase it if i want to and silent transparent which are incredible pieces of make no mistake progressive metal like these are heavy ass fucking songs but they're more complicated than just any given genre label they again are doing that typical ocean size thing of uh, integrating so many different parts and taking from and taking the heavy parts and the light parts from disparate different influences and just weaving them together in that magical ocean size way they do it really well on superimposer as well which rolls mm. right out of part cardiac just like uh, unfamiliar did out of commemorative 9-11 t-shirt wonderful guitar drum interplay on the song again the guitars and the drums are both pushing each other forward in this way that i love very ocean sized dreamy quality to the guitars but that weight and the sound on the song is still kind of almost oppressive the vocal melodies i think push the song to really interesting places surprisingly catchy i think this is basically everything you would want from a a track to ocean sized song you know after you've had the intro to kind of get settled um i i think it's a really underrated track and then i love again it's almost like what um 
Uh, it's almost like what everyone in the position does with Heaven Alive into Homage to a Shame when Build Us a Rocket comes in. It's just pure mathy craziness. You've got this constantly yeah. humming, thick synthetic bass sound. You have some just bazonga drumming from Mark Huron on this song too. And these, again, beautifully layered guitar parts as the song goes into its final section. True ocean size mm. brilliance. This album, like song to song, is probably, in terms of length, is like their most approachable because a lot of these songs are just around four minutes. Some of them are just over three minutes. The longest one is, uh, yeah, just shy of nine minutes. And, um, but like a song like "Build Us a Rocket," then, which probably my favorite song on this album because, like, the opening right when it starts, it, like we said, homage to a shame sounds like Dillinger. This one sounds like Lightning Bolt straight out Ooh. of the gate. Like mm-hmm. it just with the I guess just that, that bass sound, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm like, oh my god. And then the way the song, like again, this song is not even four minutes, but the way it progresses and the way it culminates into those like mathy, like chunky riffs of like it's so dope how they found a way to like because a song like this would be seven minutes long on any of their other albums but they really find a way to just find a pocket and just really condense it and it doesn't take away from the effect at all Mm -hmm. yeah and Uh, it leads into oscar acceptance speech which i know uh, i'm a big fan of i know you're a big fan of and it this song it's like (laughs) so we have three songs in a row that are intense heavy but still dynamic but still kind of all over the shop crazy ideas being in, uh, introduced and, and counterpoint and all that sort of stuff and then you it's pure ocean sized fashion if you know them you can see this coming a mile away it's time to get into the fucking beautiful shit with the gorgeous pretty vocals this delightful steady groove punctuated by these wonderful piano stabs actually the probably the most prominent piano since commemorative 911 t-shirt on the song the piano adds so much there's this distorted guitar solo i love just mm-hmm. great shit there's vocal interplay between mike and steve jeros as well i haven't really mentioned but steve jeros does do backing vocals on a lot of ocean size songs as well and this is maybe the best example in the whole discography of their vocal interplay it's just so good it's so charismatic it's so pretty at the same time uh, great moments that where they harmonize with each other, but also great moments where Steve will do this counterpoint thing to whatever Mike is singing. And then you get that, that's the string outro. And like, I get, maybe yeah. it's a little bit, it feels a little bit tacked on structurally compared to how usually good they are at creating flowing sections, but I don't really care when it's this gorgeous, like it's very yeah, sick yeah. esque It reminds me of the song, Antivari on their Tuck album, which does the same thing, mm. where the string outro is just like extended for like three or four minutes just because it's that beautiful and they want to linger in it. It's just so pretty, and you have this like vague, like vocal effects carrying over in parts of it as well. What a stunning song! <laughs> just amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's songs like this that, um, and the one we'll we'll definitely talk about, Silent Transparent. Oh, but yeah, it's songs like it's songs like this that like. I see, I see, like, when I try to find, like, people's main criticisms for people say, like, oh, the production or something, like, and at that point, I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking, like, are you just saying production is an issue just because, just because, like, this is produced by Chris Sheldon, like, it sounds just as good as, yeah, you know, most of the other, it was just as good as, like, Eflores, basically, to me, like, this is a fantastic sounding record. Uh, yeah, I, and, I think, and like you mentioned that on Oscar acceptance speech, when that fuzzed fuzzed out riff comes in, like it, I'm like, what about the production is the issue when the riff sounds this massive and this amazing? Like when the like, it's so I, good, it's so good. Like I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I want to shout out what I think is maybe the most underrated uh, ocean size song in general. You know, it's not top ten for me or anything, but I just think, and how under discussed and lowly rated the song is compared to how much i love it ransoms just deserves more of a shout i mm. think this is a gorgeous song i love the organ-esque synthesizer overtones it's a very slow tempo song i can understand why people would kind of glance over it but it's just again vocally it's stunning you have the vocal front and center with this gorgeous loping bass part from their new bassist steve hodson who replaced um john ellis by the way between frames in this album 
and his he makes his presence known beautifully in moments like this uh like with so many of my favorite songs by this band and many others you have an ultimate kind of tremolo picked guitar wave that comes in towards the end that i just it makes me melt into a million pieces i i completely adore it yeah it's it's a very hypnotic song which they're really good at um especially on this album Mm. i think that kind of that kind of carries over into a penny's weight which uh, if i'm being honest is probably my least favorite song on this album just because it doesn't quite have as much of a solid structure as a lot of these other songs do, but I do really love the weird off kilter, like vocal harmonies and chords that they use on this song. It reminds me most of any other band on almost similar ish band, but one of my favorites Mew. It really reminds me of like, yeah, like at least late career Mew, like what, how they layer vocals and Mm. yeah, I I, weird chords. I think this song's, I mean, I understand that it's not like as substantive as the majority of this record and fair enough, but I, I just really enjoy listening to this song. I think the chord progression yeah. is lovely. Again, kind of unconventional, but again, it's Ocean's Eyes are great at finding beauty and unconventionality. Like it's the same kind of feeling as a song like Trail of Fire, even if it doesn't do as much as that song. The vocals and the vocal layering are arranged wonderfully. I, I'd love it as a breather at this point in the record. You know, I could argue, you know, maybe having it back to back with Ransoms, you know, maybe that's too much of a breather, but I don't know. I never get tired at this point in the record. And I never want to skip this song either. And I'm a, but yeah. even though, which is impressive because I'm always ready and waiting for Silent Transparent, which is beyond a shadow of a doubt, my favorite song on this album. And I think one of the most impressive and stunning Ocean Size songs. Again, when people overlook this album, when they don't listen to it or when they disregard it, I I pity them for not fully appreciating what a magnificent piece of music Silent Transparent is. Truly showing that even though this was the last Ocean Size album, they were by no means out of ideas or running on empty or anything like that. Gorgeous guitar mm-hmm. interplay. Again, you can sense the influence of radio here. The progression in the song in the first half is very Weird Fishes-esque to me. Yeah. It sounds a yeah. lot like that. And I love their, hearing their spin on that. Again, the use of synthesizer and piano is subtle, but adds these additional layers that feel like they're, they're building off of some of the things they explored with frames. And then the last fucking section <laughs> of the song is just like, I described it on Twitter as being like the kind of post-rock climax that bands like Godspeed You Black Emperor and whoever else you want to name has been searching for for 25 years again not to diminish that band or any other band who definitely have their own equally transcendental moments but the fact that this isn't as celebrated as some of the best tracks from those big post-rock bands is a damn travesty because yeah. where this song goes again and it it, it matters that the song's first half is different to its second half because you need to set up the the conditions for that second half to really land and really hit. And it's the kind of intensity and the kind of build to the stratospheric loudness that we haven't had since massive bereavement. Yeah. It's funny that you bring up both Radiohead and massive bereavement because those are the two comparisons that this song that I always thought of, especially with the, the gorgeous double track double pan drumming on this song and the way it just envelops the mix and carries the whole song and then again just going into that climax which is easily the best climax on this album it's just yeah it it's one of my favorite yeah, moments of pure raw intense musicianship on any ocean size song and just in maybe just in rock music in general like i listen yeah. to this and by the time you get into that last minute or so i'm in pieces like my brain feels like it's exploding like a shell like i i can't even fathom how awe-inspiring the end of this song is and i love the way that it kind of runs into the the slow start of it's my tail and I'll chase it if I want to, which kind of gives you a moment to breathe. And then basically after that, when it kick starts and it comes flooding in like a dam bursting, it's basically just an extension of the last part of silent transparent. This whole song It's basically just like, let's keep that energy going. Let's give you a moment to take a, a breath and then let's kind of barrel the door down and just give you this rushing intense blast of intensity. It is 
and you got Venner doing this like super fast vocal delivery that's not quite singing and not quite rapping and he's keeping the tempo with the music while the band are like just pushing outward with their sounds and with their layers and with the textures it's incredible <laughs> yeah yeah this song is just re- flat out best way i can describe it in one word is ridiculous like it i would kind of consider this to be the the sleeping dogs and dead lions of this album mm. just because it's just it comes it almost feels like it comes out of nowhere and just like it's so outlandish and so bizarre that it's just like I, yeah, and that's what is my going thing. On? I don't think it works at all in isolation. I think, again, this is part of what makes Ocean Size an album's band. To really get the effect of this, you have to listen to it coming off of Silent Transparent. It's like the most overwhelming climax to a song you've ever heard, and then let's go and fucking push that further with another song. Like, I appreciate that indulgence here. It's so fucking awesome. And it really is yeah. just kind of the moment where the album crests. And then you get another incredibly underrated song. My absolute mm-hmm. favorite ocean size ballad, full stop, Pine. Mm. Lovely central melody, wonderful little string surge touches, gentle tremolo stuff, fantastically trippy drum pattern. Again, no other band would lay down a drum line like this on a song like this. That's these guys. That is Mark Heron. That's just his style. The way all these parts come together is still so natural. It's professional. It has beauty and confidence. The final section is a wonderful climax for every element that's been introduced in this ballad, especially those strings. I mean, what a gorgeous song. I, 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 it, mm-hmm. it so saddens me that people overlook this album because we don't get to talk about how amazing songs like Pine are. Yeah, Pine is even a song that I've underrated. Like, because I, I saw that you, like you said it's one of your favorite songs they've ever done. And I was like, okay, I'll go back to this one. And I'm like, oh my God, like, I, right. I'm, am I crying? Am I crying now? Like, <laughs> and like his, Venard's whispered delivery throughout. I just, it just gives me chills. Like, I don't even know what he's saying, but it's just, oh, it's I, just so much. I took a friend of mine to the airport the other day and I like, I've no, and because she's going traveling and I don't know when well, I'll see her again. And it's just one of those things where as soon as I dropped her off and I was heading away, I put this song on and just wallowed. And and the the, the feeling that it gives me, that kind of comforting sadness, it's just a perfect ballad. And I, I adore yeah. it so much. And I wish that it got a little bit more love. I get that maybe it's hard to kind of even process it after the just sh- sheer violence of the section of the album that it comes after. But that only sets it up to be Again, like we get with Ocean Size so much, a beautiful piece of counterpoint. I also want to oh, shout yeah. out Super Imposter, which is a surprisingly understated closer for Ocean Size. But again, considering the moody final stretch that the album has kind of gotten into with Pine, it works as an as an extension of that come down. I mean, the album as a whole has this ebb and flow from this the loudest, most intense stuff they've ever done to the most moody, most melancholic, most restrained ballad territory that they've ever done. And that mm-hmm. sheer just gulf between extremes is something that makes a song like super imposter which i think bridges that gulf a satisfying end for the album uh, it's far from my favorite individual ocean size song but still lows to appreciate as always great guitar and drum interplay interesting panning decisions that give space to the extra layers uh, everyone in the band is present and contributing unique intricate and cool ideas and you even get a sort of build that crests in a really unconventional climax of its own um, I, again, just there's so much about this album that I think even I underestimated the first time I heard it. And I think a lot of people have underestimated. Yeah, it's not completely reinventing the wheel for Ocean Size. It's more like it's taking apart the wheel and looking at you know the most extreme and and you know unconventional parts of that wheel and really focusing in on those unconventional elements and giving them the space of a whole song. But it gives you a different side of them still. It gives you a different. Uh, way in which you can appreciate how they construct a song and how they put mm-hmm. music together and i i, I love it un, unabashedly yeah <clears throat> absolutely it's it's definitely my least favorite album closer of theirs but i mean look at this competition to be fair it's it's, it's, it's you know yeah. it, it never hit any hope <laughs> yeah and that's it's fine. still a great way to yeah it's still a great way to close it uh and close a 
great album and an amazing discography that albeit is a bit too short Mm. I, w- I want them to come back, but you know, you take what you can get, and there's a lot to get from this band. Hundred percent. I want to close by just briefly alluding to the, you know, we don't know a lot about the circumstances of the breakup. It seemed like there were some in- inner band tensions, and maybe uh, one person in the band was maybe struggling with drug problems that kind of was affecting their ability to perform live and the in-band relationships. I know that um, Richard Ingram quit the band, which was the actual thing that directly caused Oceanside to break up. And the different members of the band have kind of obliquely commented without talking in too much detail about those circumstances and the possibility of a reunion. Basically, where we're at is that a reunion is not impossible, but seems pretty unlikely at least at this point in time makes me really sad as well. I mean, if porcupine tree could bring it back for a closure continuation, I'd really love an ocean size mm-hmm. style reunion mm-hmm. like that. But yeah. as it stands, you... we have four amazing albums. Yeah. Even if there's like not a new release that they like have planned, like I would just love to see them live. Like, mm. like for example, one of my favorite bands of all time, Thursday, they have not released anything since 2011. Cause they broke up after that. But they've been touring like crazy and I got to see them. So I'm, I'm at least really thankful for that. So, you know, I mean, at the very least put frames and self-preserved on streaming and reissue all the albums on vinyl, please. I just want that. But most importantly, if you're watching, listen to this band, do yourself a favor. Absolutely. All right, well, that brings us to the end of our Ocean Size Discography Breakdown. Let us know at home what the albums mean to you, what the band means to you. There we have Connor repping the actual hard copy itself. God, I want that so bad. It's the only one I got, though. Yeah, I mean... I want, that, I want the rest. I mean, it sounds like... I mean, do they have they even been pressed in a while? Like, I don't even know if if there have been fresh issues of any of their records on physical media in a long time. So that yeah. would be something, at least... Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, let us know at home what Ocean Size means to you, which Ocean Size albums and songs you love the most, what you think of them, what you think of our thoughts, some of our interpretations, and just our general overview of this discography. It's really hard to be comprehensive, and also it's really hard to avoid repeating yourself at certain points in time. So this may not have been the most perfect analysis, but hopefully our passion for the music really, really came through because they're an amazing band absolutely one of our favorite bands and they deserve to be celebrated especially when having not been around for a while it feels like a new generation is not really aware of them and maybe will completely overlook them so rediscover ocean size give them a chance spread the word as well to everyone you love who loves music and hasn't heard them and let's get this band back on top put some pressure on them to reunite would be really awesome If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel. If you enjoyed this, of course, it lets us know that you want more. And of course, your comments help us with that as well. We are happy to do more of these on other great progressive bands as well, if the demand is there. So let us know what you think and let us know what you want and show your support however you feel comfortable. If you want to become a member of the Jams and Tea family for just $1 a month, you will get perks such as having your name featured in the title call of every video on this channel, plus if you give us a recommendation for some music to talk about on our main show, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Until next time, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, PlayStation, live in your world, play in ours.